Welcome to another Sarnetta TV House of Consciousness production. We are here live in Sarnetta Studios with my brother, young brother, Divine Prospect. Yes, sir. Y'all probably seen this brother before. He featured on a couple of brother Sarnetta videos out in the street, live on 125th Street. Well, the brother is about to make a powerful splash right now. He's about to make a powerful splash, and you're going to be looking forward to hearing more from this brother. Powerful soldier, young brother, same age as my brother Polite. Yeah, man. The brother's intellectual, the brother got the information, and he's going to tell you what the topic of this lecture is. Let's bring it to Brother Divine Prospect. Peace and black power. Peace, so long. Brother, so long. All that good stuff that y'all like. I <laughs> uh, want to say shout out to Sarnetta. Um, good looking Sarnetta for um, putting me on the screen, you know what I'm saying? Because I just want this information to go out to the people. Um, you know, my main concern in regards to um, what I'm doing out here in my movement is that I'm trying to be that bridge, you know what I'm saying? Because there's a gap between uh, a lot of our communities, you know what I'm saying, in the black conscious um, movement. And uh, the information I'm going to provide now is pretty much going to seal the gap with two major communities, you know what I'm saying? The Kinetic, the Kemetic community in regards to the non Valley Africans and the Hebrew Israelites. So I deal with facts and history. I deal with theology last. You feel what I'm saying? But um, if we were to see a lot of our similarities in regards to certain texts and in regards to language and culture, we'll see that we're more connected than we actually thought. The problem is everybody thinks that we have to take a stance against one another and we think that that's edification and it's not. You feel what I'm saying? So as you can see on my shirt, it says religion. That's my, I mean, a truth, that's my religion. You see what I'm saying? I'm rocking this for Africa, but people will call me in the street a Hebrew Israelite, right? Because I use the Bible as one complementary tool for the movement of our people, for us to organize and mobilize. You know what I'm saying? I go through all kinds of ancient texts. I deal with ancient Kemet. I deal with the Papyrus of Anai, the Book of Going Forth, the Book of the Dead. I deal with the Coffin text, the Pyramid text. Uh, I mean, you name it, I go through it. You know what I'm saying? Anything I can extract and try to give it practically to our people so we can be organized and mobilized, that's what I'm here to do. And I thank Sardetta for putting me up on here so that way this information can go out. I got my, my man Red Peel here. He's yes, in sir. the audience right here. Peace to the family. Peace to the family. Um, I'm sitting here with the young guy supporting him. You know what I'm saying? I'm here with the big brother Sardetta. You know what I mean? And, you know, we just here. You know what I mean? I love information. And I really love when our brothers come through to make it plain and to help bridge the gap. So, you know, I'll be in the audience. Thank you for that, Red Pill. I just want to acknowledge him because brother was sitting here, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, I've been watching him on Know the Ledge. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that, that's a, a, a great channel, too, to compliment Sarnetta. And you know what I'm saying? I just I just appreciate the love right here. So I'm not going to hold you up. I, I know Sarnetta may have a question or two for me to get this thing started. Yes, I do got you one know, question. He's he, he the he king of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. My brother Devon Prospect. Yes, sir. I hear you saying you would like to bridge the gap. How difficult is that job for you? to bridge the gap between the Hebrew Israelites and the conscious brothers that's out there on the street in the conscious community. Because if you're not a part of the Bible or believing what the Bible say, a lot of the groups ain't trying to hear you. You see where we got Brother Nasi and the mighty Hebrew and the and Israel doctrine. Yeah. See, them brothers, you can build with. Yeah. Them brothers are sitting and build with you on yeah. that. But as far as the other Hebrews on the street, how difficult would that job be for you, brother? Um, it wouldn't be too difficult, only because I know the modern and Paleo-Hebrew. I have the text, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll text, uh, more, more so 4Q22. If you know anything about Dead Sea Scrolls and the Quran Caves, that's the ones that actually house the Paleo-Hebrew. And the Paleo-Hebrew was the script that was written by the ancient Hebrews before the characters had changed later on. So knowing the language, understanding the culture, understanding that everything was centered around the temple, and understanding that their frame of mind was built on that pinnacle that pretty much established them as a people was the temple. You feel what I'm saying? So understanding that concept, knowing the actual book itself, because I use it as one of the tools to help our people or to complement what we're doing in regards to this movement, it shouldn't be too difficult at all. The only thing is that 
I bring facts, I bring science, and I bring history to correlate to what the Bible was saying so that way we can see that it's actually not for our oppression, but if it's used properly within scientific and the realm of history, it can actually help us as a people and our black power movement. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, knowing that, you'll see, Sai, I know you, you're going to recall me on the street, getting it in with the Hebrews, <laughs> and um, I want to pretty much edify, edify them to let them know that, yo, that blacks, Africans, oh, they're not the enemy. And I'm going to do so from the book that they use. You feel <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's tough stuff right there. And I'm going to show you the mystery system and how it's linked to even, um, the Bible is linked to the mystery system in regards to Kemet. For example, if you look in the Bible, it talks about Potiphar. Potiphar was Joseph's, um, the, his, his um, contemporary. And he married his daughter, which was Aseneth, right? Mm -hmm. Pot Potiphar was one of the priests of On. And if you do any research into pre-dynastic Egypt, you'll see that the priesthood of honor is the one that actually brought the knowledge for the civilization of the ancient Kemet as we know today. You understand what I'm saying? The, the links are all in there. You just have to go through all the texts and know history, and then you can link the two up and bridge the gap. And that's why a lot of brothers are not doing We either banging on the Hebrew Israelites, we banging on the Kemetic community. I'm trying to bring things together with objective information. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, and that's what we're here to do, okay? We're here to build the bridge between our brothers so that way we can do something and work together. And you're going to see in this presentation. You have, you have a question for me real quick, Red? Nah, so what straight. I want you to do is let the people know the title of your presentation. All right. So the title's presentation is Does the Bible Provide Insight on the Condition of Blacks in America? Now this is a 245 slide presentation. I'm not going to overload y'all today. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> so I, uh, and, uh, rep to be over there. So I'm going to give y'all the first part. I'm going to come back and do the second part. But this right here is very heavy because you see I have the word blacks, quotations, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's for a reason. And we're going to get into it because, again, what you're going to see here, Sai, you ain't never seen this stuff before in your life. you never seen it put together like this in your life before. When Woo! you see this, everybody's going to be copying off this work if they're sincere about building our community. This is tough stuff right here. And you know what? It took me, what, a couple of weeks to do it too. You understand what I'm saying? But I put work in here. But you're going to see. You ready? Right. I'm ready. All right, let's go. Let's, let's get, get it in. in. No, you want to hold the mic while you talk. Okay, I got you. All right. I got you. Okay. Let's get to that. All right. I got you. You good. You good. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, as you see the title here, Does the Bible Provide Insight on the Condition of Blacks in America by Devon Prospect? That's me. I'm your host for today. And we're going to go to the first part of this thing, all right? First thing we want to look at is our current condition as a people. You feel what I'm saying? So, if we look at the stats here, black poverty rates. You feel what I'm saying? All families, 24.2%. All other races, 11.8%. With related children under 18 years, is 33.2%. Poverty rate, 18% for all other races. Married couples, look, it goes down a little bit more, but in comparison to all the other races, look who we got as a people. Your point. You know what I'm saying? It's not working. Okay, use your point. It's, it's not working on right you. Oh, okay. That's good, that's good. All right? Female householders with no husband. Look, look how high that poverty rate is. That's the majority of our communities right now. All the other races, even though this is high, is much lower than us. So as you can see, in regards to the stats, Poverty is a disease, man. Dis-ease. It makes us uncomfortable, and we're suffering more than anybody else. But why is that? Let's go to the next slide. African Americans and public assistance. You feel what I'm saying? Percentage of African Americans receiving public assistance or who live with someone who received public assistance in 2009. Take a look at that. Yep. Housing, Section 8, cash assistance, food stamps, Medicaid. We're doing bad, man. We, we, we on this more than anybody else. And if you know anything about the Constitution, if anybody subscribes to that, it was supposed to provide, I'm sorry, promote the general welfare, not provide for it, but now they're providing for us. You understand what I'm saying? This is done by design. Let's go to the next slide. History of poverty in the black community from 1959 to 2012. Take a look at this, family. You see this? 70% in 1959. Now, we're doing better. We have 41, right? And this right here is for black families with female household and no male present. Look how high it is. Mm. Right? But when you have a male present, look how low it is. But we still at 25% in regards to the percentage. But we're doing better from 1959 because we have more information, more knowledge, more resources, etc. We're doing better, but we got to get this down, family. We got to get this down. All right? 
Next, crime rate statistics. I'm going to go through this real quick. According to the BGS, non-Hispanic blacks, and all, all my sources at the bottom, uh, accounted for 39.4% of the prison and jail population in 2009, with whites at 34.2% and Hispanics at 20.6%. Now, just so y'all know, there's only 44 million of us in America, right? And out of 44 million of us, look how, look how, look at, look at the, the population and ratio to Hispanics and to Caucasians. That's crazy, all right? And we have here, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, in the year 2000, there were 2 million blacks enrolled in college. In the same year, there were only 610,000 black inmates in prison. Keep going. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, blacks accounted for 52.5% of homicide offenders from 1980 to 2002. Homicide. And as, you can, as you're going to see that, most of this is black on black crime. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is a quote from W.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois traced the cause of the disproportional representation of blacks in the criminal justice system back to the improperly handled emancipation of black slaves in general and a convict leasing program in particular. In 1901, he wrote, There are no reliable statistics to which one can safely appeal to measure exactly the growth of crime among the emancipated slaves. This is right after the um, Civil War. About 70% of all prisoners in the South were black. This, however, is in part explained by the fact that accused Negroes are still easily convicted and get up long sentences. That didn't change, that's still the same way today. While whites still continue to escape the penalty of many crimes even amongst themselves. And yet, allowing for all of this, there can be no reasonable doubt but that there has arisen in the South since the Civil War a class of black criminals, loafers, and near do alls or do wells, who are a menace to the fellows, both black and white. Let's keep going. Again, black prisoners by offense. Drugs, we in there, 21.1%. Robbery, 18.9%. All right, in regards to all other inmates, so that's that's Asian, that's Caucasian, that's Hispanic, 13.6. In regards to robberies, we have more robbery crime offenders in prison, more drug crime offenders in prison. This is not by accident, family. Keep looking, murder, 14.4%. We are still murdering more, and most of that is black on black crime. Now, when it comes to different things like rape and other sexual assault, that's the one thing I can say that we lower, and we, I mean, that's one crime at least. We don't OD him, but still, look at the percentage, man. This, something is wrong, something is wrong. Again, state and federal prison incarceration, 572,900 blacks in composed to, as comparison to whites and Hispanics in 2000. And if we jump to 2010, look, we still up there, fam. And there's only 44 million of us. There's more Hispanics and Caucasians in America than there are African Americans. This is a bad ratio, let's keep it moving. Life expectancy, look at this, 2007, for, for blacks in general, 73.6, but the black male, 70 years old, this is life expectancy. He retires at the age of 65 and only has five years to enjoy his retirement before his life expectancy expires, fam. Something's wrong with that. The, the black females living longer than us too. So men, we carry a lot of distress, but the females, they're living a little bit longer and this is why they're very important in our community because once we're gone, they're gonna be raising the kids. All right? Also, look in regards to white males, 78. White males live longer. I mean, whites live longer on, on average, but their white female lives to be 80 years old. So she gets to enjoy 15 years at least of her retirement before she's gone. And the white male gets to enjoy at least 10 years of his retirement before he's gone. Let's keep moving. African American life expectancy. The life expectancy has improved greatly for Americans during the last century. One thing that has remained consistent during this time is the lower life expectancy rate for African Americans compared to whites. The good news is the decrease in the gap between black and white life expectancy, which has dropped from a 14 year difference in 1900 to less than five years in 2007. So we're making some improvements, some strides, but it's still not to where we need to go. The African American death rates are directly related to the state of black America. America is experiencing a crisis in health care obesity, cancer, and other chronic seriously fatal illnesses. This crisis, like most others, had a greater effect in the black community. They have less access to appropriate health care, and that includes preventative care for children and adults. So, African Americans are not only more susceptible to disease and illness, they are also more likely to die from them. Let's keep it moving. Top 10 causes of death for black Americans from 1980 to 2007. Heart disease is up there, cancer, stroke, unintentional industries, and this is in 1980. Now, jump to 2007, you see that HIV is up there and kidney disease. 
But look how many deaths. That's a lot, fam. Every year? That's a lot. The most disturbing number is the life expectancy for black men. Black men are least likely to live past 70 and on average die just before that age. They are least likely to collect retirement, social security benefits, even though they contribute during their working years. Black male state of health is also affected by the environments. This contributes to the high number of deaths by homicides and the recent surge in death by HIV infections. Okay, fam? Let's keep it moving. Heart disease, death by ethnicity. As you can see, we have the top percentage in regards to heart disease. Let's keep it moving. Okay? Achievement levels of 12th grade students. Look at this chart, fam. Blacks, look how low our achievement level is. You see that? Look at that. Look where we at in comparison to Hispanics. The reason why Hispanics are low and they got some of the excuses is because they speak a foreign language and they come into America trying to learn in English schools. We should not have, we don't have that excuse, fam. Look, look at Hispanics and whites. I'm sorry, um, Asians and whites. They're neck and neck almost, but whites is much higher in regards to the achievement levels of 12th grade students. We got more dropout rates than any other race in America. Keep looking, high school dropouts, percentages. Look at that, blacks, 21.3. Hispanics are higher, again, that's because of the language barrier. But look at whites, they have 14, we have 21, fam, that's 72. Now look, the good thing is, it's going down. More of us are staying educated, but again, 8.1, 5.2 here for whites, whites have 5.2. Okay, we at 9.3. This goes to show that there's something wrong with the institutional system. And this is a reason why it's a barrier to prevent us from actually, you know, I would say make strides in this, in this orthodox state of, of education, all right? Or higher learning, whatever you want to call it. Let's keep it moving. All right? Eighth grade, average mathematics. We look at it, look. Blacks at the bottom. Math at the bottom. Look at this reading scale at the bottom. You see that, fam? Look where the Asians and the whites at. Look at that. Look at look at this huge gap right there. You That's see that? That's powerful right That's there. That's crazy. You're powerful information. Right. Show that again, man. Go no, back. Let's go back. Let's go, go back. back. You got to really drive that point <laughs> home, brother. Look at this. Mathematics scores. Look at this. The U.S. Department of Education from 1990 to 2011, we went up to here, 260, right? Look at the Asians. The Asians. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to show you why that's the case. It may not be this lecture, but you're going to see it. And then you have here. Because of what? There's a language barrier, right? But look at the whites. They up there neck and neck with the Asians. But look at the reading. Fam, we don't even read books. You know what I'm saying? Look at this. Look, look at the disparity there. You see what I'm saying? That's crazy, son. But let's keep it moving. Okay. Let's keep it moving. All right? Percentage of public school recording at least one incident in violent crime. Now, if the school has more than 50% blacks, the percentage of violent crimes is 82%. But it gets less. If there's more Hispanics, it's less. And if there's more whites, there's less crimes that black students do in those schools. That's not by accident. Percentage of high school students threatened or injured with a weapon on school property in 2009. Look at that. Black and Hispanic. Look at the percentage. With a weapon in their schools and their communities. Whites, 6.4%. Keep it moving. Now, that's the statistics part. And I want you to keep that in mind because that's very important. We're going to come full circle, all right? So, I'm going to give you a little quiz. I got my brother Sadnetta and Red Pill here, right? So, let me ask you all a couple of questions. Normally, when I do this, I ask a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you a question, Sal, or Red Pill, any one of y'all. What language was the original Torah or Tanakh written in? What language? The original Torah or Tanakh? Yeah, that's the Old Testament in the Bible. Aramaic. That's one. I was going to say that as well. Okay, what else? What other language did the Israelites speak? Oh, Hebrew. There you go. Hebrew, <laughs> right? Okay. So Hebrew and Aramaic, right? Aramaic is two books. You have the book of Ezra. And you have the book of Daniel that has some Aramaic in it, but most of it is written in Hebrew. Now, here's another question. What color were the people who wrote the original Torah of Tanakh? Me and you. Uh -oh. Look like me and you. What about you, Red? Yeah. So they would you agree have... that they were dark-skinned or that they were black? Would you agree that they were dark-skinned or that they were black? Yes. They were black. Okay. What geographic location were the authors located? The ones who wrote that book. And what they call now the Middle East. The Middle East, right? Or what they call Israel or Palestine, mm -hmm. right? That's where they were located. Let me show you something. Turn it back on here, son. Let me show you something. Look at this. All right? Well, actually, all right, before I show you this, the, the charts, let me go through a couple of things, all right? Things to note about the authors of the Tanakh. They claim to be divinely inspired to write their text. They claimed. Let's mm -hmm. keep that in mind. They were fallible men writing literature to explain the matrix of history, science, and culture in which they evolved from. Mm -hmm. 
They were limited in the scope of knowledge and understanding due to their geographic location, lack of complete historical facts, as well as archaeological, anthropological, and biological data. Keep that in mind, fam. All right? All right, let's go next. Other things to keep in mind. We must address the original manuscripts and translated text with skepticism due to the author's shortcomings and the long duration of time when the text was written until now. We must apply textual criticism. That means comparing the text, right, in regards to language, in regards to spelling, in regards to um, older text and newer text. And hermeneutics, that's a way of asking, exegeting or extracting from the text to understand what the author was intending to the manuscripts and translated text to derive the author's original intent. We must compare and contrast the Bible with historical facts, scientific data, and our modern disposition to extract concepts, principles, and prophecies so we can properly apply them today. Keep that in mind, fam. Let's keep moving. The Bible does not give dates, only durations of time. Man has put dates on it, but only duration of the times. Therefore, we have to employ scientific data and historical facts to properly ascertain the approximate dates of the events. This is very important because this is one concern that the committed community has about the Hebrew Israelites. Y'all don't give us dates. Y'all don't give us no dates. Okay? And there's a reason for that. But this on the second part, I'm going to deal with the dates thing. This one, I just want you to keep that in mind. Now, look at this next slide. Now, I want y'all to read that up there. I want you to look into this camera. Gotcha. Just go. All right. I want y'all to look up here. What does that say? Daily UV index. Mm -hmm. All right? The UV index is ultralight index. This is the part of the country, uh, of the, uh, the world, actually, that gets the most UV radiation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Look, look at the map, fam. Look at Africa. Africa's being bombarded. That's because it's tilted, and again, it's an oval shape, and it's exposed more to the sun than any other part of the earth. That's not by chance. Mm -hmm. But let's look at this. Because remember what I told you. I asked you, the people who wrote it, what color were they? Mm -hmm. look, at, look at the Middle Black East Black. area. You see how dark that, how, how red that is? Yeah. Now look at this. That's skin tones in comparison to the UV index. Look at this. Look at that. It's consistent. Melanated people. Look at this. So that complexion right here is like me. Yeah. You, you feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But as you get into the interior of Africa, look how dark and black they are right there. You see that? Yes, sir. So the people who originally wrote it, they were melanated people. Because if you look here, look, look what color they are here. They ain't got no color. UV index? Look, sun ain't hitting that place at all. <laughs> you see that? This is very important, fam. Keep this in mind as we go forth. Let's keep moving. Now, there's a direct correlation between the geographic distribution of UV radiation and the distribution of indigenous skin pigmentation around the world. Areas that receive higher amounts of UV are generally located close to the equator tend to have darker skin populations. Areas that are far from the tropics and closer to the poles have a lower concentration of UV R, which is reflected in lighter skin populations. Researchers suggest that human populations over the past 50,000 years have changed from dark skin to light skin 50,000 years ago. And vice versa, as they migrated to different UV zones, and that such major changes in pigmentation may have happened as little as 100 generations. Look at that. 2,500 years, within 100 generations, is when you can get a significant change in skin tone. Let's keep looking. Dark skin. All modern humans share a common ancestor who lived about 200,000 years ago in sub-Sahara Africa. The melanocortin 1 receptor, MC1R gene, is primarily responsible for determining whether feel melanin and eumelanin. Pheomelanin, if you have a higher ratio of pheomelanin, that determines that your skin pigmentation, your hair pigmentation, is going to be red or yellow. If you have a higher of eumelanin, that means your complexion is going to be either brown or black. Keep that in mind. That's science, fam, all right? It says it's primarily responsible for determining whether pheomelanin or eumelanin is produced in the human body. This is consistent with positive selection for the high eumelanin Phenotype seen in Africa. Phenotype is the expression of your genotype, which is your genes. Seen in Africa and other environments with high UV exposure. Light skin. Now, light skin means pale skin. For the most part, the evolution of light skin has followed different genetic paths in European and East Asian population. Two genes, however, KITLG and ASIP, have mutations associated with lighter skin that have high frequencies in both European and East Asian populations. They are thought to have originated after humans spread out of Africa, but before the divergence of European and Asian lineages. Keep that in mind. 
Europeans and Asians had a common ancestor before they split and went their ways. This is science, fam. I'm not making this stuff up. Let's keep it moving. Look at this. Next thing I'm going to deal with is language. Look at this chart right here. This chart shows you the breakup of the different language or family of languages that's in the entire, um, on the entire globe scale, right? I'm going to get you more specific. Afro-Asiatic. All right. Now, this may be a little faint here, but if you look, Afro-Asiatic covers the Arabian Peninsula, all of North Africa, the Horn of Africa. They spoke an Afro-Asiatic language. That means they all had a common ancestor who spoke a similar tongue. Let's keep moving. If you look at the Afro-Asiatic family tree, we have the Berbers, the Chadic, the Kushic, the Amitic, the Semitic, and the Egyptian. That's very important, fam. And we look here to see the dispersal of that. Mm. So that means that language-wise, if you look at a Semitic language, and a comedic language, there's similarities, fam. Keep that in mind. Let's keep it moving. We also have the Naga Congo family trees. That's what you see here that touches the um, West Africa and part of the Congo. And a little bit towards South Africa. That's another family tree. And if we go to, we see that we have the Mande, the, the Kota Fanani, we have the Ajoy, the Dugar, the Valto, the Congo. This is the breakdown of the Naga Congo. So some of the quote unquote slaves that were taken into captivity spoke either Naga Congo or Afro-Asiatic. That's very important. Keep that in mind. Now, let me show you this. The Indo-European. Mm. Now, this is modern now. So they started in this area here in Europe, also here in India. But look, America, South America, all of this is dominant. Australia for the Indo-European family language. Now, there's a reason why I'm showing y'all this, and y'all going to see why I'm showing y'all this. If we look at the family tree, the Proto-Indo, Proto means primary or first, Indo-European, it breaks down to the Indo-Iranian, the Hellenic, the Celtic, the Italic, the Bantu, Slavic, the Germanic. Now we come from the Germanic tongue, which is the West Germanic, that goes to the Anglo-Frisian, the Old English, the Middle English, and the what? The Modern English. So now if you see, based on the UV light, based on the skin color, you're also going to see a distinction that correlates with that in regards to language. That's very important then because we're speaking English now. But the authors did not speak English. They spoke an Afro-Asiatic tongue. Let's keep it moving, fam. Y'all Yo, gonna get it. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm showing you here, okay, is the development of that ancient Semitic Hebrew text. It started out similar to what's called hieroglyphics or the meta -netra. Metu means divine, okay? And net, I'm sorry, metu means speech. Um, the W at the end is no U because if we know anything about the um, comedic language, we understand that there was no vowels. So they used the do to actually replace the U, and that gives you the us sound. And med do, whenever you hear the U at the end, like netaru, that means plural, right? So if you look at that language, you'll see that they drew in scripts, they drew in hieroglyphs. Same thing, the ancient Semitics, they drew the same. Look at that, fam. Same. You see that? And then over time it developed to the middle of Paleo Hebrew and now to the modern Hebrew. And we jumped here, it looks just like the late modern. And then now you got the Greek and Latin. Now I'm going to show you something, fam. Look where the Greek and Latin evolved from. Look. Semitic, Phoenician, ancient Hebrew tongue is where the Greeks actually formed their character system. And their phonetics, the word phonetic comes from Phoenician. Okay, learn language, fam, and you understand that the Bible could not have been written in this tongue because this is what the people spoke, and their language was stolen by who? The Greeks and the Romans. Let's keep it moving. Here's something that's really gonna mess y'all Hebrew Israelites up, and y'all my brothers, but I want y'all to see this. Plate tectonics. I want y'all to study science. Science is really good, man. The discovery of volcanic activity on the ocean floor in the middle of the Atlantic that turned out to be part of a long, unbroken mountain chain of undersea volcanoes was the most groundbreaking discovery that supported the theory of continental drift. Okay, that's to do with the plates shifting and the lithosphere. Underneath you have the asthenosphere, which is the semi-solid molten rock. And because that's always moving, that's causing these breaks or these forks and the lithosphere, the crust, to shift and cause earthquakes or for them to actually separate from one another. This is science. I'm going to show you why this is important. They all got together and started drawing a new map of the world that showed volcanic and seismic activity was concentrated along certain areas that looked like the margins of huge crustal plates. And if you look here, we have the African plate, the Arabian plate, the Indian plate, the Eurasian plate. This is what separates continents from one another, scientifically speaking. Now watch this. Y'all watching? Watch this. 
Look at this. These red lines are faults. Those are breakup in the crust that separates continents. Let me show you the next screen. Look at this. The Jordan Rift Valley was formed many millions of years ago in the Miocene Epoch when the Arabian plate moved northward and then eastward away from Africa. The plate boundary which extends through the valley is variously called the Dead Sea Transform or the Dead Sea Rift. The boundary separates the Arabian plate from the African plate, connecting the divergent plate boundaries in the Red Sea to the East Anatolian Fault in Turkey. Now what am I saying to y'all? You see this fault that's going right through the Levant region? Israel's part of Africa. Did y'all hear me, fam? I'm going to say it again. Israel's part of Africa. This is the science behind this. I'm going to show you a better picture. Look at this. You see this fault line? Separates Israel, Tel Aviv is an area in Israel, from the rest of the Arabian plate or Eurasia. Israel's part of Africa. So for the Hebrew Israelites that be banging on the committed community, y'all Africans, man. This is where your nation was at in Africa. Science-wise, study plate tectonics, and you'll see that. And that will be can come together, fam. Let's keep it moving. I want y'all to understand this so y'all don't get it twisted on where I stand. Myth. Short definition of myth. A story that was told in the ancient culture to explain a practice, belief, or natural occurrence. A usually traditional story of ostensibly historical events that serves to unfold part of the worldview of a people or explain a practice, belief, or natural phenomenon. Look what I have at the bottom. Allegory. As the basic process of arousing in the reader or listener a response to levels of meaning, provides writers with the structure of fables, parables, and other related forms. By awakening the impulse to question appearances and by bringing order to the mythological interpretation, allegory imparts cultural values. What am I saying? The Bible has a bunch of myths and allegories in it. If you take everything literally, you're going to be in the esoteric realm on the outside. Esoterically on the inside, there's deeper meaning to what's being said there. So everything is not to be taken literal unless you can correlate it with science and with history. This is very, very important. This is why you see, if y'all call me Hebrew Israelite, I'm not wearing nothing on my head. I don't have my beard growing out. Not because I don't respect that. It's because you got to understand a lot of things were esoteric rites of passage. It's different from the ones in the know who was dealing with it esoterically. Let's keep it moving. And I have more information on what an allegory or myth is. Let's going to keep it moving. Now, let's get into the Bible. Now, I want you to get an introduction first. Understand skin color. Understand tongue or language. Understand myths and allegories. The Bible has a bunch of them in the book of Genesis or better sheet. That means the beginning, okay? So here, Genesis 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the cattle and over all the earth. Now, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. Then God blessed him, verse 28. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And if you look at Psalm 82, again, the reflection is there that you are God's. So the Bible is telling you that you are the reflection of the Creator, and if He's God, therefore you have some of Him in you as well, fam. Let's wake up. All right, I have that at the bottom. Man was created in God's image, therefore he's a reflection of God by birthright. Mankind was given the command to populate the earth before the great flood, and they did so through the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. Let's keep it moving. Genesis 2, and the Lord God formed man of the dust, afar. It means dust. Afra is the masculine noun. Masculine means concrete, right? Now, of the ground, which is Adama, which is a feminine noun. Feminine means something that's abstract. So the ground there wasn't literal, but the dust or the substance of the earth was. So where am I getting at that? At, if you look at the bottom, Adam was made from the black, dark red soil of the earth. That's very important. This is a myth or an allegory indicating skin color. Very important why they talk about the ground. Because if you look anywhere about what we're about to talk in regards to the Garden of Eden, you'll see that the ground was either black or it was dark red soil. That's the best way you can get for any kind of irrigation or agriculture. Now, look at verse 11. Well, actually, not even verse 11. Let's look at verse 10. Well, actually, it's going on. And out of the ground, the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon, the whole land of Havilah, and I'm going to show you what that is, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. 
Verse 13, the name of the second river is Gehon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of what? Cush, which is Ethiopia, right? Or, or Sudan, southern Sudan. It says here, the name of the third, which we know is the Tigris and Euphrates. Now look at the bottom, fam, what I wrote. Pishon is an extinct river, which we're going to see, which ran from the north tip of the Persian Gulf, where Kuwait is at, to Havilah on the western coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Gehan was another name for the Nile River, which partly ran um, north from Ethiopia to Egypt. So if you know anything about the Isle, it runs from south to north. That's because of the elevation of the land mass. And if you look anything about the topography of the earth, you'll see that Kemet is new land. Oh, man. Y'all do your research on that. Let's keep it moving. Okay? So that means that the garden, based on what we saw, right? Because remember, you have the Gihon and the Pisan, and mind you, those are referring to other rivers. Now, I'm going to show you this, this right here so you can see what I'm talking about. The Pisan River emanated from Kuwait all the way to this part of the Arabian Peninsula. You see that, fam? And if we see here, it's from the Wadi al-Batin, right? Read at the bottom. Pisan has not been flowing for the last 4,000 years. Today is only a dry valley called Wadi al-Batin, whose source is located in the most arfurious area of Saudi Arabia, just north of Medina. However, during the wet season, prior to 3500 BCE, it is used to spring from the Arabian Peninsula and would join the Euphrates. Shortly after that time, perhaps around 2000 BC, it dried up. Recently, however, this dried up riverbed was discovered by means of a satellite photo by Farouk El Baz of Boston University. He concluded that the river initially flowed for more than 650 miles from the Hajaz Mountains in Saudi Arabia to Kuwait, where it joined the Euphrates River. The story of this discovery was published by James Sower in the Periodical of Biblical Archaeology, sources at the bottom. That means that the river that the Bible was speaking about actually existed, and we have what? Satellite photo imagery that we can see the riverbed that used to exist there. Ah, oh, that's good. But what about the other river, the Gihon River? Let's keep it moving. Tigris River, as you can see. So part of the garden existed in this area here. Let's keep it moving. Now, the Gihon was another name for the Nile River. But it evolved, the tongue, the language of it. This is what the Hebrews called that Nile River. You're never going to see the word Nile River in the quote-unquote Bible. They have other names for it. The Nile River was part of where the Garden of Eden was taking place at, fam. And I'm going to show you how relevant and important this is. Look, look what it, the Nile River is. The Blue Nile ends up in Ethiopia. And as you can see, it starts here to the Great Lake here. It's where the rest of the river flows from. Let's keep it moving, fam. Now, Earth's access. The general belief among experts is that slight changes in the tilt of our planet's rotation axis caused the desertification of this huge area. The findings of this study are that the sedimentological and geochemical properties of the lake sediments confirm that the Sahara has been drying slowly from 6,000 years ago to reach the present conditions around 1,100 years. So if you read the Bible text, it talks about all of these trees and all of these things that were growing where? In the Garden of Eden. We see that part of it was where the Tigris Euphrates River is, part of it went through the Arabian Peninsula, and the other part was where? Where? In Africa, where Ethiopia was at, where Kemet was at, where Sudan is at. That's very important information, fam. Keep that in mind. It wasn't always desert. And because the Earth's axis tilts every certain thousand years, as is it the Earth's axis tilts, you get more desertification. That's why Arabian Peninsula looks the way it is now and why the Sahara looks the way it is now. But it used to be a lush rainforest, a lush jungle. And this is the things that the ancients knew and understood. Alright, let's keep it moving. This here talks about the Great Oasis again. The Sahara and the Arabian Peninsula haven't been green for thousands of years. That means prior to that, there were green, lush rainforests. Take a look at this. The source is at the bottom. So I'll tape if you want to go over it, alright? The land of Punt. Now, I'm going to tell you why this is important. Remember, we're bridging the gap between the Hebrew Israelites and the Kemetic community. The land of Punt, also called Poenet or Poen by the ancient Egyptians, was an Egyptian trading partner known for producing and exporting gold. At times, Punt is referred to ta -netcha. It should be ta -netcha ru because U at the end of any word in the Kemetic language or the Metruneta is plural, right? The land of the God, it should be the land of the gods. The exact location of Punt is still debated by historians. Most scholars say they believe Punt was located to the southeast of Egypt, most likely in the coastal region of what is today Somalia, Erita, Debajoti, northeast Ethiopia, and the Red Sea coast of Sudan. However, some scholars point instead to a range of ancient inscriptions which locate Punt in the Arabian Peninsula as well. It is also possible that the territory covered by both the Horn of Africa and Saudi Arabia is also the land of Punt. 
We're going to see why that's important. At times, the ancient Egyptians called Pont Tanecha, meaning God's land. This referred to the fact that it was among the regions of the sun god. And this is where you get the sun folk. That is the region located in the direction of the sunrise to the east of Egypt. Older literature and current non-mainstream literature maintain that the label God's land when interpreted as holy land or land of the God's ancestors meant that the ancient Egyptians viewed the land of Punt as their ancestral homeland. The Bible is talking about the same thing, the ancestral homeland. That was what the Garden of Eden was. Let's keep reading. It says here, E.A. Wallace Bush stated that Egyptian tradition of the dynastic period held that the original home of the Egyptians was Punt. That's where the Egyptians came from, the Garden of Eden. Let's keep reading. The term was not only applied to Punt located southward of Egypt, but also the regions of Asia, east and northwest of Egypt, such as Lebanon, which was the source of wood for the temples. All right, let's keep it moving. If you keep here, the majority of the opinion places Punt in eastern Africa based on the fact that productions of Punt as depicted in Hatshepsut's illustrations and she was a queen of the 18th dynasty, were abundantly found in the Horn of Africa, but were less common or sometimes absent in Arabia. These products include gold, aromatic resins such as myrrh and ebony, and if we keep going, it says Punt has been identified with the territory of both the Arabian and Horn of Africa coasts. Remember, I told you that the river Gihon, it goes through the Arabian Peninsula, and we have the Nile River. All of this was considered the Garden of Eden. And I'm going to show y'all how powerful this is. You ready? Let's keep it moving. Okay, in the 18th dynasty, this is important, Hatshepsut built the Red Sea fleet to facilitate trade between the head of the Gulf of Aqaba and Punt and South as far as Punt to bring mortuary goods to Karnak in exchange for Nubian gold. Hatshepsut personally made the most famous ancient Egyptian um, expedition that sailed to Punt. During the reign of Queen Hatshepsut in the 15th century BC, which is the 18th dynasty, ships regularly crossed the Red Sea in order to obtain bitumen, copper, carved amulets, naphtha, and other goods transported overland and down the Red Sea to Alat at the head of the Gulf at Aqaba, where they were joined with frankincense myrrh coming from north from the sea, overland trade routes, etc. What is this saying? The same element that's referred to in the Bible regarding the Garden of Eden was the same thing that the Kemets or the ancient Kemetic dynasties, the Nasuts, understood and they made expeditions down the Nile River so they can go into Ethiopia and trade with the orig Aborigines that were there because they understood them to be their ancestors. This is very, very yeah, important. Yeah, a few people say you need to slow down a little bit. Slow down? Bit. All right, gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> They're going to like, calm down. Slow down. Yeah, all right, gotcha. He's going through it. <laughs> all right. Pharaoh Queen Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt, Sheba, Moroe, and Ket to Nefer. That's very important. Hieroglyphic texts of chiefs present tribute to the Queen Wall Relief. You can see this in Egypt. See this in Egypt. Okay? One must conclude from the hieroglyphic text above describing the procession scene shown in these exhibits, which is this right here. Hieroglyphics on the top of column two, right, identify the Anu Antiu people of the country Kenuthanefer. Keep that in mind, the Anu people. Keep that in mind, okay? It says here, while the hieroglyphics at the bottom of column two identify people from the contiguous country of Maroe, we know that as the Nubian kingdom, right? The island of Lake Tana are mostly totally obliterated. The location of Tanecha, it should be C-H, Tanecha, the land of the gods and ancestral origin of the ancient Egypt Kemet was the equatorial Nile River. If you look at the bottom, Kenu Netha, identified as Tanecha, or Land of the Gods, was the Bible's Garden of Eden. We're going to see where this is from. Keep reading, fam. All right, look at the, the philology or the etymology of the word Ketu Netta. We know that as Ket means garden or land, Hen means flower plant, Nefer means pleasant, beautiful, happy. All right, a large garden with a lake in it with many trees, groves, orchards, pleasure grounds. Now look at this, Budget Dictionary. Ta Aknu. Land of the Spirits, part of the Central or Southern uh, Sudan, Budget Dictionary, Kat Hanefa, the Southern Sudan. Now we're talking about the Nubian folk, or the Anu people, or the Sun folk. Okay, Budget Dictionary, Kant Tatsti, the Southern Sudan. Let's keep it moving. In the English Bible, it's called the Garden of Eden, Atan, Garden of Pleasure. Hebrew Bible, the Garden of Pleasure, Get Eb Atan. Egyptian Hesepshot Temple record is Kent Hanefa. That means that the Kemets, the ancient Kemets, they understood that Kent and Nefer, right, was the Garden of Eden. This is the same thing that the ancients who wrote the Bible were referring to, okay? The esoteric meaning is the place of spirituality, pleasing plants, i.e. trees grow naturally 
yielding meditation, inducing reactions in humans and animals. So there was a, 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 a euphoria feeling when you went into this land, okay? This is why it's called the Garden of Eden or bliss or happiness, okay? And if you look at the new and according these are other things that indicate it as well. So let's keep it moving. Okay, last thing. Ta Neksha, which is Kent to Nefer, exoterically the Central African Great Lakes of the Nile River, and esoterically the location of the legendary biblically cited Garden of Eden, the Ta Neksha, of ancient Egypt and Kemet, and thus destination of various punt expeditions by our new pharaohs, or new suits, source of frequencies and myrrh. So what they understood is that they was going back to the land of the gods or the Garden of Eden to do their expeditions to extract natural resources. And they understood that the Anu people is where they came from because those aborigines were the progenitors of the Egyptians or ancient Kemet. Keep that in mind, fam. All right. Now, again, this here is the Garden of the Gods, the Sumerian paradise. The Sumerian culture also spoke about this land. Right. But from their region, they're the Tigris and Euphrates. All right. The Ophelius Pinchus suggested in 1980 that Eridu was a Sumerian paradise, calling it not the earthly city of that name, but a city conceived as lying also within the abyss containing a tree of life fed by the Euphrates River. Okay? So the Sumerians also believed in a garden or a, a place of paradise, but it was along the Euphrates. So now you're starting to see where the ancient Hebrews were deriving their information from. Let's keep it moving. Okay, we spoke about Lebanon. Okay, Lebanon is in the Levant region or north of Palestine or Israel. And if you see here in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh travels to the Garden of the Gods, Tad Necha, through the Cedar Forest and the depths of Mashu, a comparable location, a Sumerian version of the mountain of Cedar Felling. And remember what I've spoken about earlier about Lebanon. Lebanon was also known for its wood and its trees. And again, this was the place where um, the 18th dynasty would go to extract their wood. And the Sumerians believe that to be part of their garden of eating along the river. Keep that in mind, fam, okay? Let's jump forward. Okay? Again, Epic of Gildamish describes Gilgamesh traveling to a wondrous garden of the gods that is the source of a river next to a mountain covered in cedars and references a plant of life. Enki and Neherzasag, right? The myth of Enki and Neherzasag also describes the Sumerian paradise as a garden, which Enki obtains water from YouTube to irrigate. So this is showing you that in Sumerian culture, they also talked about the garden, but they had one portion, the Egyptians had the other portion, but the ancient Hebrews brought it all together, fam. Keep that in mind. All right? So now, Genesis 2, all right? So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was found, a help, there was found no helper comparable to him. Keep that in mind. That's very important. This is referring to the first pairing of modern hominids. Possibly Homo autobrogensis from 600,000 to 300,000 BCE, which was the progenitor of the Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, 200,000 to 250,000 BCE, which relocated north to Europe, and Homo sapiens idaltu, which remained and expanded in Africa. Homo sapiens sapiens, which we are today, evolved from this common ancestor of Homo sapiens idaltu. So the Bible is a myth, but it's giving you information in regards to science. And the ones who were writing it understood this, but they had to write a story for those on the outside. Use science to correlate with this stuff, and you'll understand how real it is and how relevant it is us what's today. So if you go forward, this is information on Homo heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis is an extinct species of the genus Homo, which may be the direct answer of both Homo neanderthalensis, remember why I'm saying this, in Europe and Homo sapiens. The fossils have been dated to between 600,000 and 400,000 years ago. Let's keep it moving. Uh, well, actually, regarding social behavior, evidence suggests that the development and use of a proto-language was done by the Homo heidelbergensis. Because remember, in the garden, they spoke. So this was the first hominid that actually had a proto or primary language. That's very important. Let's keep it moving. Okay? And in terms of evolutionary tree, with the spread of Homo heidelbergensis out of Africa and into Europe, the climate at this time would have caused a divergence. The Homo neanderthalensis diverged from Homo heidelbergensis probably some 300,000 years ago in Europe. Homo sapiens probably diverged about 200,000, 100,000 years ago in Africa. And here's some pictures for y'all, all right? Now, Genesis chapter 3. So he drove, man out, he, he drove out the man and he placed cherubim or cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword was turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Remember, they're giving a mythological or allegorical story to define your scientific truth. Man exited out of the garden, thus forcing him to explore and populate the rest of the earth. If you keep reading here, 
It says that after he begot Seth, which is Adam, the days of Adam were 800 years old. People were living for a long length of time. If we study pre-dynastic Kemet, we understand that all of the writings from Manetho, when he was recording all of the ancients before uh, Menes or Narmer, they lived to be hundreds and hundreds of years old. So now you get to see where some of this information is coming that is being extracted by the ancient Hebrews to tell their story. Okay? The sons and daughters of Adam and Eve were probably Homo heidelbergensis, what I mentioned earlier, who migrated north to Europe and evolved into Homo sapiens, Neanderthalensis, and others evolved into Homo sapiens idolatry who remained in and migrated throughout Africa. This was done because of divine commandment for Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply the earth before the flood. They're trying to tell the story of a scientific and historical truth. Let's keep it moving. Okay? Then it says, uh, Cain. So after Cain killed his brother, and this was the first uh, sons of Adam and Eve, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land nigh on the east of Eden. So he went east. Now the Garden of Eden, as we understand, again, a portion of it was there in Kemet and then Sudan, and then Ethiopia, where the Nile ran. So he went east towards the Middle East, or the Arabian Peninsula, right? And it gives you more information here in verse 22. And as for Scylla, she also bore Tubal Cain, and instructed every craftsman in bronze and iron. And Tubal Cain, uh, uh, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And it says here, Lamech, which was his father, said, I have killed a man for wounding me. So Cain left Africa, went east to Nile, which is the Arabian Peninsula, and in Mesopotamia, where he started his city and his lineage. Due to murder and corruption, his lineage was singled out for destruction by God. Now I'm going to show you something, okay? I'm going to show you something. Okay? Genesis 6 talks about the wickedness of man, right? Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters born unto them, the sons of God, and the Ben Elohim, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all whom they choose. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence, the lineage of Cain, Okay, through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, he's telling him to make an ark, right? Look at the bottom, God was eradicating local inhabitants. Local inhabitants were the descendants of Cain. Noah collected local animals for the flood. Now, this was not no global flood. You have to understand history, science, and what the literature is saying. At X, understand that sometimes it can be a feminine now and refer to something that's abstract or a small part. It doesn't mean the whole entire globe. English is a bad translation, so you got to learn the Paleo and the modern Hebrew to get to understand what they're talking about. Let's keep it moving, fam. All right? So it's saying here that after the flood happened, then God remembered knowing every living thing and all the animals that were on the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from the heaven was restrained. So now at this point, after the flood, he found himself where? In Mesopotamia, right? Which is near the Arabian Peninsula. Let's keep it moving. The flood myth. A flood myth, a deluge myth, is a narrative in which a great flood, usually sent by a deity or deities, destroys civilization. It's not new to the Bible. Often in an act of divine retribution. Parallels are drawn between the flood waters of these myths and the primeval waters found in certain creation myths, as the flood waters are described as a measure for cleansing of humanity and preparation for rebirth. Most flood myths contain a culture hero who strives to ensure this rebirth. This stuff is good. Look here. The flood myth motive is widespread on many cultures as seen in the Mesopotamian flood stories. The Hindu religious books, India called Paranas, the Daculean from the Greek mythology, Genesis flood narrative, Keats from the Mayan peoples, Mesopotamia. This flood myth was not just centered in the Bible. It was all over, fam. This was a cultural thing. So that means an event did take place. Let's keep it moving. Okay? Hold on, now, say that again? That means that event did take place, you said? Yes, it did. Okay. And it's recorded by the ancient cultures, and I'm going to show you science to back that up. The Mesopotamian flood stories concerning the epics of Zeusudra or Gilgamesh of Atrahasis and the Sumerian king list, it relies on a flood motive to divide its history into pre flood and pro flood. The Samaritan flood myth found in the Deluge tablet was the epic of Zeusudra, who heard the divine counsel to destroy humanity. Now we see similarities between the Sumerian or Mesopotamian culture and the Bible. Understand where the matrix of Egypt or Kemet and Mesopotamia is where their culture evolved from. This is very important, fam. All right? This goes on to tell you about the different other, the Sahatha, Brahmaha, and you got the Matsya, Avatar, and Vishnu. This all tells you about the different flood myths or deluge myths that were in different cultures. So it wasn't just in the Bible. Now, is there a reason for that? Is there a scientific reason for that? This flood could have resulted from a rise in sea levels after the Ice Age. Another hypothesis is that a meteor comet crashed into the Indian Ocean around 3000 to 2800 BC, 
created a 30 kilometer undersea Burkle crater and generated a giant tsunami that flooded the coastal lands. In ancient Mesopotamia, the Sumerian kingdoms reached after kingship came down from heaven. The kingship was taken up to Shurupak, and Shurupak Ubera Tuta became king. He ruled for five stars and one nair. So this is telling you here that according to what the Sumerians taught and what science talks about one of the hypothetical things looking at the crater in the Indian Ocean that there could actually have been a flood. Let's keep it moving. The geography of Mesopotamia area was considerably changed by the filling of the Persian Gulf as the sea waters rose following the last ice age. Remember, they created an esoteric story to explain a natural phenomenon so they can create a belief system for the people. Let's keep it moving. All right? This here right here says, a new book explores Noah's flood, says Bible and science can get along. David Montgomery is a geomorphologist or a geologist who studies changes to topography over time and how geological processes shape landscapes. For nearly two centuries, there has been overwhelming geological evidence that a global flood as depicted in the story of Noah in the biblical book of Genesis cannot have happened. Not only is there not enough water in the earth system to account for water levels above the highest mountaintop, but uniformly rising levels would not allow the water to have erosive capabilities attributed to Noah's flood. Montgomery says. Now look at this. It says some rock formations millions of years ago show no evidence of such large scale water erosion. Some rock formations, I'm sorry, Montgomery is convinced any such flood must have been at best a regional event. Perhaps a catastrophic deluge in Mesopotamia. There are in fact Mesopotamian stories with details very similar but predating the biblical story of Noah's flood. If your world is small enough, he says, all floods are global. This is a geomorphologist who is studying the claims of the Bible and says that there is, yes, there, there could have been a flood, but it had to have been local and because the people didn't understand how vast the world was, they saw that local flood as a global flood. This is where this culture came about. Let's keep it moving, fam. All right? At the same time, concurrently, you had an ice age. It was affecting where? Most of Europe. Mm -hmm. None of that ice touched Africa. That's very important that we understand that. Look where the ice age touched. Mm. This was before and after the flood. This also contributed to the peoples and the environments in which they lived. You're going to keep it moving. Now let's talk about the Ice Age. Let's keep it moving. Keep it moving. We're going to skip that. All right. Now, we're going to go to Genesis 9. So now we see this story about Noah coming out of Oliven, Africa, going towards the east. Right? And there was a flood. And the flood, he, was, he created an ark because God told him to create this ark. And he wound up in a Mesopotamia region. Now, when he came out the ark, it was him, it was his wife, his three sons, and his son's wives, right? They ended up in Mesopotamia. Now, I want you to see this very, very important, fam, because I want you to see where the Caucasian came from, the Asian came from, okay, the African came from, and the Middle Eastern came from. This is very important because this right here is the prophecy that the Bible speaks to our people and our condition today in America. Look here, fam. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, he planted a vineyard, then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. So if you read the language in the Paleo-Hebrew, even the ancient Hebrew, you see that in regards to the offense that Ham did to his father, we don't know if it's sodomy, we don't know if he looked upon his nakedness as, as written in the Levitical law, but he did something that offended his father, and now Noah has spoke a prophecy. Now watch how real this is. Get this, sign It says here, then he said, Cursed be Canaan, not Ham, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And it says here, And may Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge, or patah, which is a hippo imperfect. Imperfect means a future tense. And hiphal means it's a, it's, a, it's a literal forcing opening of it. Japheth, which means literally means open. And may he dwell in the tent of Shem, and may Canaan be his servants. And we read that again. May God enlarge Japheth. Enlarge Japheth. All right, whoops, let's go back. My bad. And it says, And may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Let's, let's, let's see what this stuff means. Because of Ham's offense towards his father, the offspring of Canaan will be enslaved and subdued by the offspring of Shem. 
This curse caused the Canaanites to be corrupt in their worship towards El or Il Ilion, the Most High, and not dwell in the territory allotted to them, causing them to eventually be invaded by Shem. Now we look at that prophecy being fulfilled. Shem's lineage will be blessed. Because Shem means shame in the Hebrew, which means a name, a sacred name, or authority. Japheth's lineage will be colonialists who enlarge their territories. The Greeks, the Romans, the Europeans, and the Asians. The enlargement. Japheth enlarging the Greeks, the Romans, the Europeans, and the Asians. Japheth's lineage will dwell in the homeland of Shem, the state of Israel, and in his, in his tent of meeting, which is his synagogue. So now Japheth is going to be in the state of Israel, the land of Israel, Palestine, and also be in the churches or synagogues or temples of Shem, disguising himself to be Shem, but he's going to be in those tents because if you look at the Hebrew, when they say tents, it can either literally mean the tent of meeting or a tent of worship or a tent in regards to where you live, your land. This is very important, okay? Let's keep it moving, okay? Japheth's descendants will make Canaan's descendants his servants, which is why the state of Israel was established to enslave and exterminate the Palestinians. Mm. Those people in the state of Israel, the Khazarian Jews, are from the lineage of Japheth that are in the disguise or intent of, or the disguise of Shem, or the Semites, or the Hebrews. George Friedman, in his book, The End of the Jewish People, pointed out, uh, stating that the Europeans claiming to be Jews were nothing more than Hebrew-speaking Gentiles. The late president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, stated on television, you Jews will never be able to live here in peace because you left black and you came white. We cannot accept you. That's very important right there, fam. Hmm. All right? References, Genesis 16, God promised Abram the land of Canaan because of their wickedness. Genesis 17 and 5, God changed the name of Abram to Abraham and blessed them. Genesis 35 and 10, God changed Jacob's name to Israel and blessed them. Genesis 49, 28, Israel blessed his sons before entering to Egypt. Moses' forefathers only knew God as El, El Elyon, and El Shaddai. If you know anything about Canaanite culture, you know that Il or El was the father god of creation. He was also known as the bull god. That's very, very important because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only knew God, okay, or what you call Yahuwah, by the name of Il, El Elyon, which is his title. Or Al, which is more of the proto Canaanite, all right? Leviticus 20, 18, 24 to 8, 28 says the children of Israel were commanded to keep God's commands so they will not be destroyed in the land like the Canaanites where they went into. Let's keep it moving, okay? Then it says here, God's promise to Noah. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The reason Homo sapiens sapiens, right, Noah and his family, survived until this day, his offspring, and all other parent hominins. Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis, Homo sapiens Idaltu, etc., became extinct is because Noah and his family received a divine blessing to repopulate the earth, and the other hominids did not. Because remember, the sons of Adam and Eve, who were not part of the lineage of Cain or part of the lineage of Seth, populated Africa and Europe. There were still people living there. The flood only wiped away the lineage of Cain when he went towards the Mesopotamian area and it was a local flood because we don't have any flood myths in Africa. That's very important that we understand this, fam. And the blessing they received was divine. That's why the Homo sapiens sapiens which evolved there in the Middle East and repopulated the earth are the modern hominids today because the rest of them did not receive the biblical command to be fruitful and multiply thereby which they were eradicated, died, or became extinct. So what they were telling you was a mythological story, and if you look at the esoteric information behind it, it's telling you history and science so you can understand that the Bible is actually correlating with this information if you get away from these rites of passage. Some of them are good, and some of them are too restrictive, and you won't understand the full story. Let's keep it moving. Now, this right here is the most major part of this presentation. All right, how am I doing on time? Anybody give me the time? You good. Good? Okay. Nations descended from Noah, and this is why I'm talking fast, y'all, because there's a lot of information, and we pre press a little bit on time, but now, the, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Listen to what I said again. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and to them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tobol, Meshach, and Tyrus. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, which in uh, Hebrew means German or Germany. That's where you get the Ashkenazi Jews from. And Rephath and Togama. 
and the sons of Javan, Elash, and Tarshish, Ketim, and Donahim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles. I'm going to say it again. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, and in their nations. The Gentiles were from the lineage of Japheth. And we're going to see that the lineage of Japheth was the progenitors of the Asians and Caucasians. Scientific and historically speaking. My Hebrew Israelite brothers and sisters, please understand this information. Let's get this correct knowledge so that way we can edify not just our people, but also the committed community and bring them in together. Mm -hmm. Look what I just said. The Gentiles are the lineage of Japheth. That's the Caucasian and the Asian. That's very, very important. Now we go to verse 6 and it says, The sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, which is another name from Egypt, or Kemet, and, and Put, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah. Remember, Havilah was a region where? In the Arabian Peninsula. And Sata, and Rama and Sabateka, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Ananim, and Lahabim, and Naphtim, and Patsharim, and Cushlasim. And Kaptorim and Canaan begat Sidion, his firstborn in Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergosite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Aravadite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamath Hamathite, remember Ham means black or dark, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread and spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidion, as you come to Gerar, to Gaza, where the Gaza Strip is. And as you go to Sodom and Gomorrah and Adama and Zeboim, even to Lashad, these were the sons of Ham after their families and after their tongues in their countries and in their nations. The Africans is not the Gentiles. Understand what I'm saying this, fam. This is the layout here. The only people that's related or called the Gentiles was the lineage of Japheth, which is the Caucasian, the Indian, and the East Asian, scientifically speaking. And we're going to keep it, keep it moving. Now this is the lineage of Shem. To Shem also to follow all the children of Eber, the son of Japheth, the elder, even to him were the children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Ashur, and Asphaxet, and Lud, and Aram, and which we get Aramania or Aramic from, and, and this, was, uh, this is where Syria is at. And the children of Aram, Uz, and Hul, and Gepta, and Mash. And the Asphaxet begat Salah, and Salah begat Eber. And Eber were born two sons. The name was uh, of one was Pele, for in his days the earth was divided, plate tectonics, they give you hints of science, and his brother's name was Joktan, and Joktan begot Almodad, and Shelephah, and Hazar Mepheth, and Jareth, and Hamadad, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Abal, okay, and uh, Abamal, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling was from Misha as you go to Shephar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations and their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So the thing that we're going to take out here is the Isle of the Gentiles, or the land of the Gentiles, okay, were the lineage of Japheth. And we're going to see where this lineage um, populated, what parts of the earth they populated. Let's keep it moving. Okay, early human migrations. Now we're talking about um, the flood, right? We're talking about Noah, his wife, his three sons, his three wives. They left out of Africa because they was banned to the east. The east had a cherub that was keeping them going towards the east part of the garden. So they were pushed out into Africa. Adam and Eve were pushed out into Africa when they left the garden, right? And then uh, Cain, after he killed his brother, he went, he went east to Nod. And then after the seventh generation of Seth, which was who? Noah and his sons, they went east to Nod. So science is telling us that there were early migrations out of Africa into the Middle East, which is the Mesopotamian area. That's very important. And here we see migrations out of Africa occur sometime later. Around 125,000 years ago, modern humans reached the Near East from where they later spread across Asia and Europe. From the Near East, these populations spread east to South Asia by 50,000 years and on to Australia 40,000 years. This is what we just said. They left out of Africa, went towards the Near East, and then they went to Europe, and they went to Asia, okay? Now let's keep it moving. This is a map of the early human um, uh, populations in regards to the exodus out of Africa going into the rest of the, the Earth. As you can see here, all of these numbers. Remember, the Bible does not give any dates. So they're speaking a mythological story 
okay? Because they're talking about the history of man from what they understood it to be, and science correlates with that story. Also, other cultures, Mesopotamia and Kemet, correlate with that story. Let's keep it moving. Now, according to this map, we see where the lineage of Ham populated, from what we read in Genesis 10, the Table of Nations, the lineage of Shem, where they populated, and Japheth. Look where Japheth went. He went here to the north to Europe. He went here to the east to China. That's very important. You know why that's important? Because this is where the Caucasian came from. Not from Edom. Not from Esau. He came from the lineage of Japheth. My Hebrew Israelite brothers and sisters, please understand that. Scientifically speaking, and according to the Bible or the Tanakh, Japheth is the Gentiles. That is where the Caucasian and Asians came from. Let me get, let me keep it moving. Again, we see another map on where they populated. The blue here is the lineage of Ham. This red here is the lineage of Shem. And Japheth again, Europe and Asia. These were the Isles of the Gentiles. I'm going to show you why this is important. But first, I want to show you where we had a migration back into Africa from the Middle East where Noah and his sons were because they repopulated the rest of the earth. So the lineage of Ham went into Africa. And now if we look here in this book here, the Egyptian Mystery School of Art, which is a great book, by the way, by George Singleton. And I, anybody who deals with ancient Kemet, this should be your Bible. You need to read this because this talks about pre-dynastic Egypt. It's awesome. This is a great book, right? Let's read here. They show you four races of people that the ancients, pre-dynastic, a new people, or the uh, ancient uh, Kemet, that they understood that existed, right? The four races of humans recognized by ancient Egypt Kemet described below right to left as follows. The first, right, the first race on the right, facing right, is the mysterious, dynastic, dark red Hamitic people who invaded the Nile River Valley in the late pre-dynastic demigod period at about 10,000 BC, called herein the Theban invader people and ethnographically part of the Hamatic group. They introduced mummification of the dead and the concept of body resurrection into ancient Kemet. They brought with them for the first time into Africa their cattle, horses, sheep, goats, hogs, and other domesticated animals, which led to the deforestation, the desertification, and ultimate fall of the ancient Egyptian civilization. That means that we had natives or aborigines from the other sons of Adam and Eve that lived in Africa, but now you have this influx of this new race or these new homo sapiens sapiens coming from the lineage of Ham, from the line of Ham, right, the lineage of Ham or Noah and the line of Ham coming into Africa. And now we have a record on the Kemet side stating that 10,000 years ago a dark Kemetic race came into Africa. You see, if you mix the cultures and you understand these things, there's so much relationship to one another, it is astounding. Let's keep it moving, all right? Now here, early back to Africa migration into the Horn of Africa. This is a scientific or genetic study that was done to show what we just heard about in the previous slide about the dark Kemetic race coming back in and doing what's called an admixture with the Aborigine people there, which were still Homo sapiens or archaic Homo sapiens. Now the Homo sapiens sapiens that received the blessing from the Most High to repopulate the earth came into Africa and guess what? The indigenous people there went extinct. And again, we can look at that from that book, The Mystery School of Arm, very important. That's an Egyptian or Kemetic source that indicates this Hermetic race coming, to, coming in. And this right here, this is a great read by Jason A. Hodgson, published on June 12th, will show you to early back to Africa. Once they left Africa, Noah and his wife and his sons, then his lineage came back into Africa. And now we have the genetic studies regarding the admixture in the Horn of Africa. We have the genetic studies here. This, this um, scientific uh, journal right here that validates what the Bible is talking about. That's very interesting. Let's keep it moving. All right? All right. Mitochondrial Eve. In the field of human genetics, the name Mitochondrial Eve refers to the matrilineal uh, most recent common ancestor, or MRCA, of all currently living anatomically modern humans who is estimated to have lived approximately 100,000 to 200,000 years ago. This is the most recent woman found from whom all living humans today descend. Now mind you, mtDNA only comes from the mother, all right? So they have to test the mother or a female to determine the common ancestor for this um, mitochondrial DNA. Descend on the mother's side and through the mothers of those mothers and so on back until all lines converge on one person. Because all mitochondrial DNA generally is passed from mother to offspring without recombination 
all mtDNA, which is about 60,500 nucleopeptides, and you can go look that up, and every living being is directly descended from hers by definition, differing only by the mutations that over generations have occurred in the germ cell mitochondrial DNA since the conception of the original mitochondrial Eve. Well, why am I bringing this up? My footnote at the bottom is Noah's wife was the mitochondrial Eve who passed on her mitochondrial DNA to her daughters who were the wives of Noah's sons. She is the progenitor of the homo sapiens sapiens mitochondrial DNA that we have today. The Bible was on to something. Let's, let's jump forward. Y chromosome or Adam. In human, geni in human genetics, Y chromosome or Adam is a hypothetical name given to the most common ancestors from whom all currently living people are descended patrilineally, which is the males, tracing back only along the paternal or male lines of their family tree. However, this title is not permanently fixed on a single individual. Y chromosome Adam was named after the biblical Adam, but the bearer of the chromosome was not the only human male alive during his time. Now, the reason why that's important is because when Noah was alive, Cain had other descendants that were there. It was crazy because the homo sapiens sapiens came from the lineage of, of um, Noah because he received the divine blessing to repopulate the earth. Now, Noah was a Y chromosome Adam who passed on his Y chromosome gene to his sons and to every male homo sapiens sapiens afterwards. Very important. Let's move forward. If you look at this map, Homo sapiens appeared on the scene about 200,000 years ago with origins in East Africa. And we can see here the haplogroups for mitochondrial DNA. L0, which is the parent or the common ancestor. Then you had L1 and L2, which populated South Africa and Northwest Africa. L3 haplogroup moved north until Egypt or Kemet, and they moved out until the Arabian Peninsula, and they split. And then we have these other haplogroups, H, T, U, V, W, I, J, K, which is the Europeans. Then the M and M, N and M is the Middle Easterners from the L3 haplogroup. What am I saying? That means that the ancient Kemet, right, the uh, Aborigines of the ancient Kemet, or the Hamitics, they had the same DNA, mitochondrial DNA, uh -huh. as who? Seb. Very, very important. So they're inter they scientifically speaking, they're interconnected. Understand this stuff, fam. Understand this stuff. Alright, we're gonna we're gonna skip through here. Alright. Same thing, we're seeing the same thing here. All the haplogroups groups and their migrations out of Eden into the Middle East. And then the re-migration back into Africa, Europe, etc. But remember, other sons of Adam and Eve went north and populated Europe, and they were the indigenous people, and they were the Neanderthals. We're going to see that in a minute. Yeah. Okay? Same thing here. Showing you where Eve, where she came from. Because remember, Noah and his wife, they left out of Africa and went east, and that's where the flood happened at. So let's move forward. Now, genetic drift. Apparently, as different groups move on from their larger group, which we just yeah. saw in Africa, Gradual changes took place. These minute changes are explained in various technical sources, explaining how DNA reproduces and recombines uh, generation to generation. Genes are reorganized, placed in different order on the same chromosome, or at times shifting chromosomes. This is called recombination. Additionally, a gene may be slightly damaged in the process of cell division or recombination. All the processes involved in the creation of offspring results in slight differences over generations. Remember, we saw that 2,500 years worth of generations. In the male Y chromosome, the sequence of such changes can be seen since the tail of the Y chromosome is passed onto the male heirs rather than theirs recombined. This is primary source of information enabling recreation of human biological history. So as they left out of Africa and they split and went different ways according to the biblical story, there were mutations that took place in regards to their genes. This is why now we know in Africa you have the big lips and a wide nose. The reason why the nose was wide is because it was a dehumidifying process so they can take in more air and it can be involved into their lungs. The reason why the nose is much smaller when you go to Europe is because they were trying to keep a lot of air from coming in because the air was cold and it was not conducive to their lung stature. And this is through the mutation of DNA. This is very important. You have facial features, you have language, and you have skin complexion or melanin that all change due to this. All right? So let's keep moving. Now I want you to see something interesting. If you look here, you see the red is the Homo sapiens sapiens, right? Which we which we know now was um, you know Adam and Eve, and then eventually it, it put the progenitors of them. Uh, their offspring was um, Noah and his wife. They went and repopulated the rest of the earth. And this range here in Europe, the other sons and daughters of Adam and Eve that were the indigenous people there became the Neanderthals, and the Homo sapiens sapiens 
went and mingled with them. You're going to see that. Let's keep it moving. Now, all of these dots here are the sites of the Neanderthals. Right? All of these sites, mostly in Europe and parts of Asia. Let's keep it moving. Same thing here. Mostly in Europe, parts of Asia. Now, if we look at the biblical story, it shows you who populated Europe, who populated Asia. The lineage of Japheth. Populated Europe, populated Asia. Let's keep it moving. Homo sapiens idaltu. These were the aborigines that lived in Africa that wound up becoming extinct when the Homo sapiens came back in and repopulated Africa, which we saw from previous sources. Homo sapiens idaltu is an extinct subspecies of Homo sapiens that lived almost 160,000 years ago and Pleistocene seen Africa. Idaltu is from the Saro Afro word meaning elder or firstborn. The fossilized remains of S. idaltu were discovered at Herto. Baru near the middle Awash site of Ethiopia's Afar Triangle in 1997. So if we look at where the garden was at, we understand that in that regional area, we had the first of the Homo sapiens that came on the scene and left out of Africa. Again, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their, and their wives, that the Bible was telling you about something if you do history, if you do science. It's explaining something to us. And, and um, archaeology and anthropology. Let's keep looking at this, fam. The fossils differ from those chronologically later forms of early Homo sapiens, such as Cro Magnon, found in Europe and other parts of the world, and that their morphology has many archaic features not typical of Homo sapiens. These were some of the aborigines that evolved from the Homo heidelbergensis in Africa, which from the sun, other sons of Adam and Eve. This is very important because this is telling us a lot on how the earth was repopulated in correlation to the biblical account. Uh, Sonetta, mm -hmm. you have a, um, a plug for this? What's Real that? Quick? For what? For the... Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. It's I thought we had One second, fam. For what, though? For the computer. I thought we had it plugged up. I thought it was plugged up, too. Nah, it's not plugged up. Yeah, you got some people on there, you can hear them saying, get out the Bible, get out the Bible. <laughs> so, you they know, they just break down. Okay, I got you. I read, come on, because it's going off. Yeah. Why, why are we in this Bible, man? <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, get that mic to start talking to them. Let them know why we're in the Bible. We decoding the book. There we go. So, my, my, my big brother... Or well, big homie Sonetta just explained that the reason why we're in the Bible is because we're decoding it so we can understand that this myth that was written in there is extracting, we can extract information so that way we can build our people. Can, can you see me clear? Okay, it's good? Yes. yes. Okay. And the reason why we're going into the Bible is because the Bible is one of many tools to complement us here and our condition in America. It gives us some historical data, some scientific data, and some myths. Just like when we go into ancient Kemet and look at the Papyrus of Anai, the Book of Going Forth, these things don't have a lot of prophecies in it to speak to our people today. But the reason why I use the tool as one of the things is because it lines up with history and science and it speaks from the lineage of Japheth, the lineage of Ham, the lineage of Shem, and explains to you why we're in a similar condition that we are today. And we're going to see that in part two. So if you'll give me some time just to run through it, we're decoding the myths that's in the Bible with science and history so we can have a better concrete understanding of what these things are written about. Ask anybody in the House of Consciousness who deals with ancient Kemet. You think they all believe that those gods that were written about and those papyrus on those walls were real? No, they were myths regarding principles for us to understand so we can extract that information and apply it today so we can build our people today. They're both complementary, and we gotta stop hating on the Bible because we gotta see it wasn't written by white people. We just saw that. And we saw the family language, that's very important. And we gotta understand these melanated people were onto something. And if we extract it in its proper context, we can use it today, fam. This is very, very important. And that's why we're dealing with the Bible. Y'all feel me? Y'all good? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep riding. You ready? Yes. Alright. So let's just put this back on. Anything you want to say, Sam? Um, no, I, 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 I agree with you, up. man. I'm with you on this. You can tell why you're getting it done. Yeah. So, so while I'm loading this up again, because the battery died on us for a second. There we go. There we go. Um, that's why we're dealing with the Bible. But as you can see, okay, I'm not dealing with it from a religious sense. 
okay? Right. I'm showing you history and science to correlate with the myths that's in the Bible because there's things we can extract out there that help build our people. Now look, remember I said that the Japheth enlarged his tents and I said that that's the lineage of the Asians and the Caucasians based on science, history, and what the prophecy says. Japheth are the colonialists and we're gonna see that. That's very, very important, all right? So this is the Homo sapiens I doubt to. Again, these were the, uh, the Aborigines that were in Africa. This is where the lineage of Adam and Eve, their children, they stemmed from and became the Homo sapiens. Let's move forward. Here is all this information so that family can go and study it on who the Homo sapiens I doubt to were. The Bible talked about these people just like they talked about the Neanderthals and we're going to see about that in a second. Discovery the, um, the earliest Homo sapiens skulls back out of Africa theory. Remember, the garden was also in Africa. Uh, a, a cherub was placed on the east side to keep them from coming east and therefore they went um, west into Africa. This is very, very important from all the other documentation that we spoke about. So this talks about more of the Homo sapiens I doubt to, okay? I'm not going to get into that too much because I want to show you something. Now mind you, these were the Aborigines that were in Africa. They were living good. They had all the natural resources in Africa. They had the good sun for their skin and everything like that. And these were the people that eventually we came from. This is very important, okay? This is all all of that. I'm not going to get too much in depth about that because we're going to get into the real meat of it, alright? Neanderthals, humans interbred, first solid DNA evidence. Most of us have some Neanderthal gene study finds, okay? Let's keep it moving. According to a new DNA study, most humans have a little Neanderthal in them, at least 1-4% to of a person's genetic makeup, right? In addition, all modern ethnic groups other than Africans carry traces of Neanderthal DNA in their genomes, the study says. And it says here, but the fact is that the Chinese and Melanesians are as closely related to Neanderthals as Europeans. Genesis at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard University. This stuff is powerful. The Neanderthals... DNA is in every non-African. And if we study the Bible and we look at geography, we'll see that Israel was part of Africa. And they were the exception if you look at their haplogroup group in regards to the mitochondrial DNA. This is, this is interesting stuff. All right? Neanderthals, the study team says, probably mixed with homo, early Homo sapiens just after they left Africa, but before Homo sapiens split into different ethnic groups and scattered around the globe. The first opportunity for interbreeding probably occurred about 60,000 years ago. All right, let's keep it moving. Now, this right here, Neanderthals coexisted with modern humans for long periods of time before eventually becoming extinct about 28,000 years ago. Neanderthals are much shorter, they have more robust um, bone structure, they cannot speak any language, they didn't know anything about art, they were very primitive people living in caves, and guess who mingled with them? Oh, we about to see, one second. Okay. Who mingled with the Neanderthals? Remember, we have Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the Isle of the Gentiles, right? That's the lineage of Japheth, right? I'm going to go through all of this at another time, but we go, this is just information about the Neanderthals, so you can see that they were very primitive. All right, here, environmental climate that they lived in. It says there's another angle to the climate change theory. Evidence based on extensive surveys of sites in Europe suggests that Neanderthal replacement was not due to direct competition with modern humans, Instead, evidence suggests that the severe conditions made the continent of Europe inhospitable for all humans living in Europe. That's very important. And this is the reason why they were living in caves, right? Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon was the first archaic Homo sapien that mingled or would have mingled with the Homo sapiens. This is from the lineage of Japheth, fam. Follow me. All right? Again, it shows you that these people did not have a language. And if they did, it was very primitive. They drew some art, but they were not as advanced as our ancestors in Africa. All right? And it tells you about their culture. We're going to skip through all of that. Otzi the Iceman. Europe's oldest preserved mummy was found to possess even higher percentage of Neanderthal ascension. So from the Homo sapiens that came from the lineage of Japheth that mingled with the Neanderthals in Europe produced this offspring. You see this? Recent findings suggest that there may have been more Neanderthal genes in non-African humans than previously expected, non-African. Approximately 20% of the Neanderthal gene pool was present in a broad sampling of non-African individuals. Ati the Iceman is a well-preserved natural mummy of a man who lived around 3300 BCE. So when we was building civilizations, this was what the Caucasian was in Europe. He had 20% Neanderthal blood in his body because the lineage of Japheth mingled with who? The Neanderthals, who were the other sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, and they produced 
this. They were primitive people. They had no real civilization. Let's keep it moving. All right? Here, there's a striking correlation between geographic conditions, particularly exposure to sunlight and skin tone. These differences have evolved to find the balance between the benefits and the dangers of UV radiation absorbed by the sun. Early humankind living in sun-soaked savanna plains of Africa developed a dark-toned skin rich in the pigment melanin. Within the dark cells, melanin concentrates above the nucleus, it shields it, the vital DNA from radiation damage, in an environment where there's little to break the path of sunlight onto the skin, this barrier is a great advantage. This is talking about our skin and why it's very important. It is a UV component of sunlight that helps the body utilize vitamin D. Okay, this vitamin helps promote bone growth, maintaining the right balance between calcium and phosphorus in the body. A deficiency of vitamin D leads to rickets, which is a bone disorder, and similar diseases. What am I saying? When you have a lack of sunlight, where I showed you earlier, where you saw the UV index, you start to have these deficiencies. This is why the Caucasians were so sickly, because they didn't have enough sun. And their diet was very poor because they didn't have the rich resources, natural resources that we had in Africa, fam. All right? Light-skinned people visiting sunny locations may not have enough melanin to block the sun sufficiently and may burn their skin without the protection of sunblock. Dark-skinned people visiting these areas with less exposure to the sun may apparently not produce enough vitamin D, but can get it from supplements. So this is saying that when you take us out of Africa and bring us to another part of the world, then because we're out of our natural environment, we start to get sickly because our melanin is not functioning the way it was previously designed in our DNA. Let's keep it moving. All right? Again, I talk about here about melanin in your skin. Melanin is made in special cells called melancytes. These cells are found in the epidermis of your skin, which is the, um, the stratus corneum, and then you have the basal layer. It's where the production of these melanosomes come from. There are at least three ways people can end up with different skin color. One way is that people make less pigmentation, and that equals lighter skin. Another way is when people have fewer melanocytes. This is showing a weakness in your genes. Fewer melanocytes mean less pigment overall and so lighter skin. This is what they were suffering from in Europe. The third way is a bit more complicated. It has nothing to do with this kind of pigmentation that someone takes place. You have eumelanin, which produces black and brown, and theomelanin, which produces red and yellow. Red for the Caucasian, yellow for the Asian. Theomelanin, that's what the, it produces if you have a larger ratio of that. But depending on your geographic location, you have more eumelanin, which we as melanated or black people have. We have either brown or black skin. This is very, very important, fam. Very important. All right? Scientists have figured out that several genes are involved in skin color. One of these genes is melanocortin 1 receptor. When MC1R is working well, it has melanocytes convert pheomelanin into eumelanin. If it's not working well, the pheomelanin builds up. So now you see the mutation that happened in the lineage of JFEF and why their skin color is the way it is and why they're such sickly people because of their environment and because of their DNA, fam. All right, we almost done. This is a picture of it, so you can see the basal layer or where these melanosomes are produced at. Remember, tyrosine is an amino acid that's utilized in conjunction with carbon in order to create this eumelanin or pheomelanin that's produced or that's contained in these uh, melanosomes. They move to the surface of your stratum corneum, which is where your epidermis layer of skin is at. And when they break apart, they shield or cover the DNA or the nucleus, which has the DNA to keep you from sun damage. So this is why the Africans don't have skin cancer, okay? This is why they don't have um, bone deficiencies or diseases. Now they do because of starvation at the colonialism, but naturally, we are more superior people. Let's keep it moving. Diseases caused by lack of melanin, osteoporosis, vitamin D deficiency, rickets, immune disorders, and melanoma, which is skin cancer. Unfortunately, we are suffering from these things because we've been taken out of our original habitation. You understand? This is the stuff that the Europeans and the Asians were suffering from because of their inhospitable environment with Europe and Asia, which they had lived by 5, 10, 15, 100,000 years ago. Almost 100,000 years ago. All right? The penile gland, also called the penile body. Um, the penile gland is important to this discussion for two reasons. First, it is the center for the production of the hormone melatonin. Melatonin is implicated in a wide range of human activities. It regulates daily body rhythms, most known to be the day-night cycle. Melatonin is released in the dark during sleep. The recent melanin craze sweeping through the health-conscious community makes claims that hormone slows the aging process. Melatonin slows your aging process if you're getting older. The vents jack lag is implicated in a seasonal affective disorder, coordinates fertility, okay, and allows for deep restful sleep patterns, okay. Melatonin is, very, is a very ancient hormone that is found throughout the animal kingdom as well. 
Melatonin has been shown to inhibit the growth of metastasis of some tumors in experimental animals and may therefore play a role in cancer inhibition. When you have a lack of regulation of the melatonin based on your penile gland, and it has to do with the cloud cover that's in Europe and Asia, and they don't get enough sun, it affects their penile gland, it calcifies it much sooner, and it also shrinks it, it doesn't function properly. And as a result, fam, all right, we have here, the penile gland has been implicated in a number of disorders including cancer, sexual dysfunction, hypertension, epilepsy, Paget's disease. The penile gland calcifies with age and melatonin production correspondingly decreases. Then the decline in melatonin has been suggested to be a trigger for the aging process. There's a reason why I'm telling you this, fam. Keep looking, right? So again, this, gives you, this is another article on the disorder of penile gland associated with depression, peptic ulcers, and sexual dysfunction. Give Israel Dr. to my side out when he wants Oh, shout out to Israel Doctrine. I hope you're doing your homework, fam, so that way you can have some stuff that you can utilize for yourself and your, your up and coming debates, all right? So now, if you look at here, abstract, depression, peptic ulcers, and sexual dysfunction. This is what the lineage of JFAF, this is what the Neanderthals, they were suffering from all of these ailments. Depression, sexual dysfunction, peptic ulcers, hypertension, epilepsy, Paget's disease, insomnia, and breast cancer, fam. This is why the Europeans were so sickly, because they had a shrunken or calcified penile gland and a lack of melanin in their skin. This happened with mutations as they left out of Africa and the Middle East and populated the rest of the earth. This is very important, fam. Very important, fam. All right? How are we doing on time, sign that up? Because we wrap it up. You good? Okay. Whatever you ready. Prophecy fulfilled. Remember we talked about earlier? Japheth is launching his attempts. Shem having a blessed name spiritually, and Ham being a servant of servants, or Canaan being a servant of servants. Well, the ancient Hebrews believed that the physical labor was from the Hamites or the Africans. The spiritual endowment was from the lineage of Shem, and the intellectual endowment was from who? The lineage of Japheth. The reason why you had these Europeans had to leave Europe is because they had a lack of natural resources. They were getting sick. And they were experiencing all these types of issues and they needed to expand or enlarge their tents. This is very, very important, fam, because they enlarged it in Shem's homeland and Ham's homeland, which is the Middle East and Africa. So Japheth, the lineage of Japheth is the Isle of the Gentiles and the Caucasians, the Indians, and the East Asians. Those are the Gentiles, according to the text. This is very important, fam. I hope you follow me. The Greco-Roman world, or Greco-Roman culture, or the term Greco-Roman when used as an adjective, as understood by modern scholars and writers, refers to those geographical regions and countries that culturally and so historically were directly, long-term, and intimately influenced by the language, culture, government, and religion of the ancient Greeks and Romans. As mentioned, the term Greco-Roman world describes the regions who were for many generations subjected to the government of the Greeks and then the Romans and thus accepted or at length were forced to embrace them as their masters and teachers. The Europeans, after mingling with the Neanderthals, ex exited out of Europe and East Asia. They populated the rest of the world. And what did they do? They colonized them. This is very, very important because this was a prophecy that was over who? Japheth. And these are the lineage of Japheth. The Greeks and the Romans, fam. Let's keep it moving. European expansion. So after the Greeks, you had the Roman Empire. After the Roman Empire, you had European expansion. Again, the lineage of Japheth and large in its tents. Imperialism, as it is defined by Oxford dictionaries, is a policy of extending a country's power and influence through colonization, use of military force, or other means. The first European colonization wave took place from the early 15th century, Portuguese concept of Sayuda in 1415 until the early 19th century, French invasion of Algeria in 1830. It primarily involved the European colonization of the Americas, though it has also included the creation of European colonies in India and maritime Southeast Asia. During this period, European interests in Africa were primarily focused on the establishment of trading posts there, particularly for the Atlantic slave trade. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? The lineage of JPEF, who were G the Greeks, the Romans, then eventually the Europeans, they, or for some reason, they were under this divine curse to expand or to enlarge, and now we see it in history, as well as the Bible, as well as science, they had to get out the environment, and as well as history, all of this correlates. And this is why the Bible, if you read it for its exoteric understanding, you'll see that it gives us an explanation for the condition that we are in today. Imperialism, the lineage of JFAT. This is what all do, science. What do Acts 13, 1, have to do with melanin? 
Ask our team one? Yeah, right, I'll deal with it after I'm done with that's, this. That's the question. Question, okay, I'll deal with that fan after this. We're going to get into that because I have Christopher it. Ball win, actually. Christopher Ball win, okay. We, we got you. We're not going to forget you, all right? Okay, the Age of Discovery is a historical period of European global exploration that started in the early 15th century with the first Portuguese discoveries in the Atlantic, Archipelagos, and Africa, as well as the discovery of America by Spain and the discovery of the ocean route to the east in 1498, and by a series of European naval expeditions across the Atlantic and later the Pacific, which continued until the 18th century. Now, if you read all of this, it explains to you that they were expanding. We know the Age of Discovery is when the Europeans left out of Europe came into Africa, into the Americas, started pillaging the people there for their natural resources, even used humans as a resource, and they were expanding. Why? Because they was under a divine curse. It was a blessing at first, but it turned into a curse, and now they're enlarging themselves in the Middle East and in Africa and over into the Americas. Are we understanding this in this, people? This is why the Bible is talking to our condition, because it explains why the Caucasian is expanding into Africa and how we ended up into the slave trade. Let's keep it moving. New imperialism was a period of colonial expansion and its accompanying ideologies by the European powers, the United States of America, and Emperor of the Empire of Japan. Remember, the Japanese were part of the lineage of Japheth. They also expanded. The Japanese, the Chinese, this is why there's so many um, Chinese. There's 1.3 billion Chinese and 1.2 billion Indians. And most of those Indians is from the lineage of Japheth and they spoke an Indo-European language. Okay? Now let's look at the timeline. Greece Empire expansion and colonization from 332 BCE to 142 BCE. The Roman Empire and Catholic Church expansion and colonization from 100 BCE to 1415 BCE. The European Empire's expansion and colonization, 1415 to 1830. The U.S., Europeans, and East Asian, i.e. Japanese, expansion and colonization from 1830 to 1945. The lineage of Japheth is expanding or enlarging its borders in the land of Ham, in the land of Shem, and they have this divine curse over them, and this is why they're expanding. Science backs it up, history backs it up, and now we have here the history that's showing us their expansion. You see that, fam? That's tight right there. Now look, I'm going to show you why they expanded. Look at this. This is a modern breakup of the manufacturing or the resources that's there in Europe. You ain't got nothing there in Europe. You have nothing but machineries and motor vehicles and, and some manufactured good and computers up there. There's no, hardly any natural resources in Europe. So they had to expand and find it elsewhere. And where do you find most of the map, fam? In Africa. Look at all these resources in Africa, man. This is why they expanded and that's why they took and they robbed and they stole from Africans because of their land and which was the gods had created them and whereby which they was able to enjoy all of these goods. When you come outside of God's will, you are exiting out of Africa and going into a diaspora of other places where you were not suited to live, fam. This is very important information. So I'm going to wrap it up here and I'm going to show you again in the Bible, since you're afraid to deal with the Bible. But I'm going to show you that the Bible, or the God of the Bible, okay, you want to call him Yahuwah, whatever you want to call him, Yahweh, Yahuwah is a proper rendition of his name. You'll see here, the word of the Lord, Ezekiel 38, chapter 1, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against God of the land of Magog, Gog and Magog of the lineage of Japheth, the chief prince of Meshach and Tobal, again, the lineage of Japheth. Prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord, or Yahuwah, says, I am against you, God, chief prince of Meshach and Tobol. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out of your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them, excuse me, brandishing their swords or weapons. Persia, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. That means that the lineage of Japheth is also going to get who involved? Africans to fight against the Most High in the end times, according to the Bible prophecy. Okay, the lineage of Japheth is who the God of the Bible is against the Gentiles. This is very, very important, okay? If you look here, it says, Also Goma with all his troops and Beth Togama from the north with all his troops and many nations with you. Again, Togarama, Goma, Tubal, Meshach, Magog, and Gog, and Tubal are all from the lineage of Japheth. And this is who the Most High is going to war against in the end of times. This is very, very important because the elitists or the Europeans that are running this planet and they're the ones that the Most High is going to war against according to prophecy in Ezekiel 38. 39 compliments that it says, Son of man, 
prophesy against God and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, God, chief prince of Meshach and Tobal. I will turn you around and drag you along. I will bring you from the far north and send you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. On the mountains of Israel you will fall, you and all your troops and the nations with you. I will give you as food to all kinds of carrion birds and to the wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. I will send fire on Magog and on those who live in the safety in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. I will send fire on Magog. This is the Tanakh, okay? from the, the, the prophets that are speaking and letting you know that the Most High is going to war against the Gentiles or the lineage of Japheth that are the elitist Caucasians and, and Asians, East Asians that are ruling the planet today and the Most High is going to war against them because of the corruption and wickedness that they're doing in this planet. That also goes to show you that the Bible speaks about our condition because we have identified them here in the black power movement, a black conscious community to be our enemies. Not because they wanted to be, but because of science, history, and prophecy was against them and forced them to be the ultimate enemy. And as you can see from the Bible itself, it talks about the Most High, or Il or Al Alion, going against these nations from the lineage of Japheth, which was the Neanderthals mingled with Cro Magnon, which was the Homo sapien, and they produced Ati, the, the Iceman, which was the Homo sapien sapiens from that lineage. And they lived in a very inhospitable environment in Europe. They had all of these diseases due to a lack of melanin, due to a, a calcified um, penile gland. And because of such, it drove them mad. They had all these ailments and they had to expand or else they're going to stay where they are and go mad. They went into Africa, into the Middle East and stole resources. They went to America and stole resources. This was in prophecy and in science and in history. And if we understand that, fam, we know that the Bible is speaking to the condition of blacks or our people here in America because the Gentiles are not Hamites. The Gentiles are the lineage of Japheth. And as you can see, as you're going to see in part two, when I come back and do this, I'm going to show you how the covenant was made, all right, if you read Deuteronomy 29 and look at the people that were intermingled with the Shemites or the Hebrew Israelites, the Hamites were with them. The Cushites were with them, the Egyptians were with them, and the covenant was also made with those people. And we're going to get into that. Now I'm going to take you to the last part of my slide, Revelation chapter 20. For those of you who are in the new covenant, right? It says, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. Satan, meaning Satan in the, in the Hebrew, or Satanos in the Greek, will be released from his prison. This, this means adversary. It doesn't mean no spooky devil. It could be. But that's if you're making it in your imagination or if you believe there is one. But the adversary will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations and the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, which is from the lineage of Japheth or the Gentiles or the Caucasians and East Asians. Okay, this adversary spirit is going to rise up against them and they're going to war against the Most High and his people. Read here. It says here, they march across the breadth of the earth and surround it. The camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And as we read here in Ezekiel 39, it says, I will send fire on Magog. We know that the God of the Bible was against the Gentiles who are expanding, who are the leader of this planet, and that are robbing us of our history, our identity, and trying to get us to fight against each other as melanated people. And if we look at the Bible from its proper cultural, linguistic, historical, and scientific stance, we understand that it addresses our people here today. And part two will we'll deal with how it refers to us in our diaspora. So thank you, fam, for bearing with me. I know I talked a little fast because Sinead and all, I got, I got something to do after this, and I didn't want to um, take too much time to draw it out. But now we're going to answer some questions. If you have some real quick, I know Sonetta, Sonetta always got questions for y'all right here. Okay. And now I can, I can ease back and slow down because I think we got about like 30 minutes left, right, Son? I mean, whatever you want. You got okay. as much time yeah, yeah, as you, you want. Yeah, you got time, fam. We Don't got forget, time. man. I mean, cut that light on right there. Right. See if you can... Which one? Right this one? Yeah, turn it off. Cut it off. Turn it all the way on. All the way up. There you go. Now you can have a seat. All right. The people can see you. Now I rush through this, but now I, I love questions because now I can take some time to okay. read. Now that I'm looking at the time and I ain't got to rush, so that's good. Yeah, have a seat. All right. You good. All right, peace, my brother Devon. Very powerful. I've never seen nobody drop it like that. You coming definitely from a different perspective. Yes, sir. So now what I would like to ask you, my brother, is that who, so who are we as a people? Are we Hebrew Israelites, Moors, Muslims, Christians, Negroes, Africans? Who are we, brother? Because oh, you ain't touched on that yet. Now, yeah, I know. That's I important mean, too, but 
I'll give you who a little sneak peek. Who are we? Who are we? <laughs> All right, if you ask him who are we as a people uh, here in America, you have to go and look at the different tribes that were taken into captivity. So you have the Ebe, you have the Akan, you have the Bantu, you have the Yorubu, you have the Ashanti, you have um, the Igbo. Um, all of these were indigenous tribes that were taken into captivity. And as well, Hebrew Israelites were living amongst them. So they also were taken into captivity. So now we have these indigenous African tribes that, lived, that were living side by side with Hebrew Israelite tribes that was within them. And again, I don't want to ruin too much because for the second part, I answer all of that. But we'll see that the Hebrew Israelites were mingled and mixed with other indigenous Africans. And some of those Africans were, guess what, from where? Ethiopia, from the kingdom of Kush or Sudan, and ancient Kemet. So we were all involved in a diaspora or the transatlantic slave trade. And I'm going to get heavy into that in part two. And it's going to be without a doubt, when you see part two, it's going to be bulletproof. I'm not even going to rush through that one because I think that's the most important one. And then afterwards, the third part, I'm going to get through the social, political, and economic solution that the Bible presents as a complementary tool to help our people reverse our condition and be a nation once again. So when you say, who are we as a people? We are those tribes. We are also the Hebrew Israelites. We are all intermingled, even ancient Kemet and the Nubians. We were all intermingled because they also migrated west. If you look at the Berber tribes and if you look at the slavery that the Arabs did when they came into Africa, they all migrated west and we all as a people were taken together in captivity. And the thing I want our people to understand is that the Bible also speaks to our condition. Just like if we read any of the ancient texts from Kemet or Nubia, all of this speaks to us as a people. We can go back to the Bible also, knowing that some of the Hebrew Israelites were intermingled with some of those tribes, and look at their culture from a melanated perspective to see that it speaks to us as a black people here in America. So I'm conscious first, black power second, and I'm a Hebrew Israelite third. So anything that you want to say, fam, my ultimate goal is to unite us based on science, history, and the proper understanding of these ancient texts. So as a people sign that, I would say that we're all in a struggle together as melanated people, okay? Because we have a common oppressor, as we see, which was the lineage of Japheth, okay? Who put us into the captivity that we are in today and has oppressed us, which is the indigenous African tribes and also the Hebrew Israelites, and we are not a diaspora in a land that's not our own here in America. And part two will definitely deal with that. All right? Okay. Um, Christopher Baldwin want to know. Oh, yeah. Let's bring that up for brother right there. Brother Christopher. The brother asked a question, and um, yeah, let me get that back so I can cut on the, on the internet. I think I got it now. What you got? That right there. Um, Chris, oh, yeah, that right there. That that I don't need it. Okay, Christopher want to know, what does Act 13 1, I think that's what it was, right? Yeah, that's what he said. Have to do with melanin. Acts 13 and 1 has to do with melanin. Right. I think that's what he said. Yeah, that's right? what it sounds like. All right. I, I know exactly what he's going. So I'm, I'm going to get the New King James. Okay? Okay. And uh, Acts 13 and 1 says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, now remember this was written in Greek because that was the lingua franca at the time when they wrote this quote unquote new covenant, right? Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger or Nigger or Black, if we look in other translations, Lucius and Cyrene, Menonim, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch and Saul, or Saul or Shaul, right? So when you ask about how does that deal with melanin, the ancient Hebrews, they also was able to identify people who are from the lineage of Ham or from Africa. So the individual that they're talking about here who was Simeon, he was a black man, okay? And mind you, they didn't call him a Gentile, but they acknowledged him as a black man because it was understood that he was either from Ethiopia or from the kingdom of Cush or Nubia because the ancient Hebrew, just like the Egyptians, and if you look at their wall reliefs, it'll show you that they made a, a distinction between the Nubians and themselves. They were lighter in color than the Nubians. If you look at Ramses II's um, uh, pyramid, and you'll see where he had the um, war against the Nubians, he depicted the Nubians as dark-skinned people. So the Egyptians made a distinction, and so did the ancient Hebrews, and we identified that these were dark-skinned people. But remember, if we look at that book, The Mystery School um, of the Priesthood of An, it tells us that they understood that they came from the blacks, or the Nubians, or the Anu, or Sun folk. And this is why they made expeditions down there, because the Twa people, or the Anu people down there, were their ancestors. 
and they were black, dark. If you go to Sudan now or Ethiopia, there were some black Negroes out there, right? Mm -hmm. So they also was able to identify in the Kemet reliefs and the pyramids and the temples and also in the Bible, we identify black people, but as you can see, nothing negative is said about them. That's a very good thing because they're not Gentiles. They're in the struggle alongside the ancient Hebrews, and we'll see that in the second part. All right, any other questions, Sai, or the people, any questions? Come on, Brother Israel Doctrine. I see you out there, man. Oh, What's man. your question, brother? Brother Israel, where's your questions at? Do the people of the Bible speak more? Oh, no, no, no. Let me say this. The Bible today. Is the Bible, do the Bible speak more about what's going on today? Do the Bible speak more about what's going on today than any other book on the planet, brother? I'm going to say no. The what? Bible is one of the books that speak. And if you say it's the only book, now you're cutting off all the great leaders that came before us and they wrote information dealing with the condition of our people here in America. The Bible is one of the many great books that speaks on our condition. But brothers and sisters, if you understand your history, please don't be closed-minded and just keep it at the Bible. For me, the Bible was my main source, my main tool to build our people, but it's not the only book. I read books from Marcus Garvey, Booker T. Washington, even before them, the ancient Africans, we look at their literature, all of that speaks about us as a people. So the Bible is one tool in a whole entire tool shed. So it's this one tool family that we can utilize and for it to help or speak about the condition, and I explained to you one of them, the lineage of Japheth, the colonization, the enlargement or the expansion of the lineage of Japheth, the East Asians and the Europeans, the Bible speaks about that, and there were the colonists that came into Africa and put us into our diaspora. That's very, very important fair. Okay, so the Bible is one tool in an entire tool shed of things that we can utilize for us to build as a people. But the reason why I use it is because the prophecies in there are right and exact about how we are in the condition that we are today, but it's not the only one. You also got to take science, you also got to take history, and look at our forefathers that came before us who wrote all these great works in these books. Um, W.B. Du Bois, who I put up there earlier. You know, he was writing about after um, the Reconstruction period, how we were the most people in the South that were in, imprisoned. You know, you have to read books outside the Bible to complement what the Bible says so we can have a full knowledge of why we're in our condition and we can get different insights. But for me, the Bible is one of the main things, but again, I'm not strictly just the Bible. It's just my main source, but it's not my only source. Is, okay. that, is that good, sir? Yeah, that's good. All right. I want to say, uh, just for the record, fam, I hear a lot of people always saying that, um, yeah, no, so I'm not trying to get money off the debate, off the debate. But see, what they fail to realize, brother of uh, Divine Prospect, that's my brother name in case y'all missed it. This is Brother Divine Prospect. What they fail to realize is that Shaka Upmost, mm -hmm. we want to do it for free. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? We want to debate, Shaka want to debate the Hebrews for free. Yep, that's so that. why they keep saying, oh, he trying to get money, he trying to get money. Uh, is it really <laughs> fair when y'all know we doing it for free? Mm -hmm. So why the hell they keep saying he trying to make money off the debate. We want to do it for free because we want the room to be jam packed. Exactly. We want, we want to people to come in because Sarnetta's going to make his money exactly. regardless. Exactly. This is what they feel to realize. Uh -huh. Sarnetta makes his money. Mm -hmm. Are they mad because Sarnetta trying to make a dollar? <laughs> what the fuck wrong with our people, exactly, man? man? But hold up. Okay. <laughs> I want to clear it up again. Uh -huh. We want to do the debate for free. Matter of fact, Sarnetta is the one putting the money up, goddammit, for the room, Man. for the space. <laughs> so, ask your people, are you willing to do it for free? That's what you need to ask. Uh, so let me ask you, Sarnetta, when you said that they want to be done, are you talking about the conscious community, the Hebrew Israelites, or just everybody in general? The Hebrew Israelites, we want to shock oh. up, shock up most, we want to do this shit for free. Okay. So, you see, so we don't want to charge the people. I we want them to come in for you. free. And you know what we do? And I'm the one that's going to be paying the $1,400 $1, $1, just to that? get the room. Let me make it clear. Oh, Sarnetta man. is paying $1,400 <laughs> out of his goddamn pocket wow. to rent the space. Oh, man. And we letting y'all Negroes in for free. Now, what's so, your excuse now, so, Hebrew? So now here's the thing, right? Um, what I do appreciate about my brother Sarnetta, 
Most of y'all don't even know about Money Making Tuesdays, man. They don't even no, know we about stopped. That. We stopped it, though. Nah, I know, because nobody was coming out to that. Y'all right. was not supporting that. And it was free, man. It was free. Even when Shaka <laughs> was there doing um, the lecture on, on this one, that was free. And I was there. Right. At several of them. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And yeah. Iman Bashir was there. And you know what we make money off? The services, the other black companies that come in there, right. and that's what we make. The, you're not propelled or, or compelled to do it. It's out of your own heart. If you see your people there selling products, then you buy from your people. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Right. Now, here's my thing, Sal. The reason why the Hebrew Israelites, and those are my brothers, right? Because right. like I said, I identify myself with black power, with black conscious community, and the Hebrew Israelites because I use the Bible. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, from the wow. Hebrew Israelite culture or mindset, right? I think because there's a lack of scholarship, there's a lack of academics, there's a lack of science and a lack of historical facts that they utilize to correlate with the claims that are made in the Bible. And if you look at the lecture that I just did or the presentation I just did, I incorporate all of those different things to give credence to the text. Now, if they really want to go to battle with a Shaka Atmos, with a Brother Polite, Y'all need to call me because I will give you all the correlating facts and historical data and sciences that you need to correlate with the Bible. But I believe because the Hebrew Israelites don't have all the scholarship, all of academia, all of the history and the science to back up their stance, that is why they're withdrawing from getting into the debate. But what I will say is that, okay, Israel Doctrine, since he's on there, yeah. my brother there, he's saying that he will get at Shaka. He's saying he already got it set up for um, Sankofa on November 1st. <laughs> and if y'all didn't know about that, y'all need to tell Ajista, look into that. He gonna be there, and I, I, and I may very well be there as well. So the thing is that, I'm not helping Israel doctor, he got on his own, but if your Hebrew Israelites wanna do work, and you want a real scholar, you want somebody to deal with academics, holler at me. When you see the second part that I do when I come back to do this for Sanetta, my scholarship is solid. And if y'all have scholarship like this, academia like this, science and history like this, then y'all would not be afraid to get into the ring and do battle because your people as well as the committed community they need to see this. This is very important. All I'm trying to do is bridge the gaps between the two, my brothers. Right. So that's an excuse for a lack of academia, a lack of scholarship, a lack of history, a lack of science to correlate with the claims that the Bible's making. But if you, if y'all want me, I'll help y'all for free. Did you hear what I just said? I'll provide <laughs> y'all that work for free so y'all can get in the ring for the benefit and edification of our people. The question is, we willing to do it for free. Are the Hebrews willing to do it for oh, free? Man. See, they keep looking at Sardetta, but they don't really know the science. Yeah, exactly. Because we doing negotiations. Yeah. They don't really know the goddamn science behind why it ain't taking place exactly. right now. Exactly. We want to do it for free. But here's the question again. Uh -huh. Do the Hebrews want to do it for free? And I leave that there. Now they can answer that question for me. Now, one more thing while I'm going on, brother. Like, if you need me to help them put money up, yeah. that's not a problem. But now, to here's get them in the ring. I'll give them a consolation prize if they get in the ring. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> I love you, my brother, Israel Doctrine. I know you're watching. You're my brother. <laughs> but I'm going to keep it real with you. You're not ready for Shaka Upmost. Mm. Really, I don't see no Hebrew out there ready for Shaka Upmost. Mm. And I'm telling you what I know. I've seen his brother Lockberry. Yeah. I've been in his house. Yeah. I've seen his work. Uh -huh. Why do you think they can only make videos trying to clown him? How come you don't see no videos where they're attacking his information? Mm. You see, you don't see no videos attacking, uh -huh. oh, he a homo, he this. They playing homo games themselves. Exactly. You see what I'm saying? This brother's a straight up man. I've seen his wife. I've seen his son. I'm, come on, man. This brother's for real. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, so I know that they are scared to death <laughs> because that's why they're making them chow this damn videos mm -hmm. and they're not really attacking his scholarship. Yes. So they were reverting to the Childers games. Exactly. They scared of Shaka up most, that's, man. Let me, let me speak One more you. thing. Uh -huh. When we went to the camp, mm -hmm. they didn't even want to answer none of his questions, brother. I was there. I got so much footage. If only you would see the footage I got. Wow. I just didn't even want to put it up. Yeah. Shaka said, yo, don't even put it up, Sarnetta. <laughs> they didn't even want to deal with his questions. They kept telling him, you're not allowed to ask questions and this and that. I'm not here to teach you. But now when we leave, they camp and break out, they make a goddamn video. That, now you tell me, is that man shit or oh, is that man. homo shit they play? <laughs> That's some homo shit they play. <laughs> All right, so for the record, I'm not going to call nobody a homo. I'm not going to call my <laughs> brethren who are Hebrew Israelites or shock at most. Whatever he does is his business. But in regards to scholarship, 
What the Hebrew Israelites are doing is what's called a logical fallacy. It's called ad hominem. Ad hominem is when you have an opponent who prevents facts, and because you can't refute the fact, you attack their character, you attack their personality, you attack their history, but you're not addressing the facts. And if this was a court of law, you would begin thrown out. So what I'm saying is that because of the lack of scholarship, academia, science, history, to correlate with the claims that the Bible makes, and looking at the Bible from an honest perspective of melanated people, they don't have, again, the scholarships to defend their stance. And again, I'm willing to help the Hebrew Israelite brothers because I, I consider myself one of them as well. But I'm conscious and I'm black power before I'm a Hebrew Israelite. And I want them to understand that if you have the information, there's no need to attack character. But when you attack character and personalities in a person and themselves, that's a logical fallacy called an ad hominem. And it's because you cannot refute the facts as presented. I would even have a sit down with Shaka and go over some of his concerns in regards to the Bible from a Hebrew Israelite perspective. I will do that. So that way y'all can see that y'all don't have to run. And if you have solid, bulletproof information to correlate with the claims and have honest historical and scientific facts, then you can sit with a comedic brother who has sincere concerns trying to address the Bible. But because they don't, they don't have that sign, as you can see, if you consider me a Hebrew Israelite, Sonetta, I think you would think that I'd be the only one that can sit with a comedic brother and actually build or dialogue or even debate because I bring facts. I bring science. I bring history. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? To correlate with the biblical claims so that way I can have a dialogue and build. There's no need for me to run. I'm right here. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So our other Hebrew brothers, get your scholarship up. Get your facts up, your science up. Like community, we're looking bad, man. We need to get in the ring and we need to have a dialogue for edification with our other brothers and sisters in the struggle. And like I will show you in the second part that I touched on in the first part, the Hamites are not your enemies. The JFAP, the line of JFAP is the Europeans, the East Asians, the elitist ones, the ones that are colonizing, those are the enemies, not our brothers and sisters, excuse me, here in the committed community. So I want our Hebrew brothers to understand that um, melanated people. Melanated people in ancient Kemet, melanated people in the Levant region, which is Palestine, Lebanon, melanated people even in Mesopotamia. When you look at their language, the language came from their culture, the culture came from their environment. So what they did was they used these concrete things in the environment to describe abstract thoughts that were going on into their mind. And this was something that was um, created by melanated people in Europe, okay, and in uh, the north part of East Asia, they did not have these type of scripts or these languages. So when you go back to these melanated people, you got to look at the original drawings that they created to create these ideas and these concepts and these ideologies that were abstract in their mind and made it concrete. So when you start to look at the ox, you start to look at the tent, you start to look at the hands, um, the man with the hands up, you get to look at the yud, these different characters in this proto canaanite format, you'll see that there's similarities in the glyphs. When you look at the chick hand there, you have the basket, they also have a basket for chet, okay? Look at these things and see the similarities to see that these people were all under the Afro-Asiatic family tree of languages and that they were all interconnected because remember, the Phoenicians, the, the Proto-Canaanites, the ancient Hebrews, they were on the land of Canaan. Canaan is a part of Africa. I showed you the Dead Sea transform, the Jordan Rift Valley. That is a part of Africa, whether y'all like it or not. <laughs> and that is where a lot of their language came from. And again, trade. Mesopotamia traded with who? With the Egyptians or ancient Kemet. Okay, the Levant region where you had the Canaanites, the Phoenicians, and the Hebrews, they traded. So you had to have a common link with Franqua in order for you to trade, and that was done through pictographs. And then it developed into scripts, okay? You had the Paleo-Hebrew script, you have the Phoenician script, and then you also had the Hieratic script, which was done for business administration in ancient Kemet, and then came to the Demotic script, which the common man used. And all of these things were melanin people used to communicate with each other for trade and to show their cultural differences and to show they came from a distinct and common ancestors. So when you understand language and culture, you'll see so many similarities that we beef in against each other and we come from the same source. You understand what I'm saying, Sonetta? Mm -hmm. And when I show you a couple of fundamentals of the Metronetta, because I will show y'all heavy the similarity between that and the Hebrews. I know, listen, I know both communities ain't gonna wanna see that. But when they see that, they're gonna be like, wow, we really, we really in this together. There's really similarity between us and we are in this condition together. You understand what I'm saying, Sonetta? Mm -hmm. So this stuff is very, very important. And when you understand language and culture and history and even science, you'll see that we're more interconnected than we believe. And then when you look at history in regards to the diaspora, 
for the transatlantic slave trade. There were Hebrew Israelites as well as Africans, some Kushites, and some Egyptians, or kind of, of those from Kemet. We were all brought into captivity together. So we have a hodgepodge of culture, and we can derive a similar story, a nation, a flag, from a conglomerate of all these sources and modify it so it can suit us as a people today. And we can advance our people to a better economic, political, and social status. And we can stop fighting, we can build, and we can make improvements. Yeah, 101 people watching right now. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful, my brother. Um, this question always hits me when Shaka brought it up. Okay. The Hebrews, you will hear them say that the Africans are heathens. The Africans are this, and the Africans are evil. The Africans are wicked. The Africans are a beastly people, right? But in the same breath, brother, they will tell you when they was trying to get away from the wicked, they kept running down into Africa. <laughs> and, and I think Shaka asked the brother, why y'all keep running in Africa? And the brother said, because we look, because, because we look alike. We look just like the Africans, right? Uh -huh. So what that tells me is that if you keep running into Africa when the Arabs is on your ass, when the goddamn the Greeks, are, the Europeans the Hittites, is on your ass, the and the Greeks, Hittites, the and the Babylonians, the Hittites, they on your ass, uh -huh. the Babylonians, y'all kept running into an unholy land. To get saved. Wait, how so hold on, hold on. <laughs> so now, uh oh, that means the Africans, the ones that you call heathens, the one that you call bastards, they are the ones who saved your ass, man. Which means y'all was into Africa. They fed you. They clothed you. Wow. You even slept with their damn women. The Bible even think about. Hold up, man. I was, I was a child in Egypt. This is something that we gotta think Egypt. about. Oh, that means man. you even slept with their women, they brother. Did. And I'm gonna show you they the They protected part. you. All of that. The Africans protected you. The ones that you call heathens. Mm -hmm. You see? Now it, so, was, now it was the Arab ones that started the slave trade in Africa, and those are the ones that converted. To Islam, yeah. so you're and some they, ungrateful and, bastards, and, man. And, and y'all was in y'all was in your diaspora, just like we here in America too. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So the the problem is this, uh, Sonetta, when they don't have a good grasp on history, when they don't have a good grasp on scholarship, science, um, they are making claims that they cannot validate. And if you look at the Bible itself, even Numbers chapter 12 and one, tell them to look that up. When Moses had a Cushite wife, and guess who spoke against that? Miriam and Aaron, his brother and sister, say, yo, yo, Moses is our leader, and he has a black woman, a Cushite. Cushite, those are black women. That Negro loved a black woman, and he had as a wife, and when they spoke against him, the Most High gave them leprosy. Mm. Oh, man. The Most High didn't condemn him marrying an African? Oh, so I know that, man. That's crazy. Also, right. look in 1 Kings, you'll see that Solomon married uh, an Egyptian woman. Joseph married an Egyptian woman. Abraham had Hagar as his handmaid and had Ishmael from an Egyptian woman. And if you look at the Arab Rev, which means a mixed multitude that exited out of Egypt, they had Cushites and Egyptians with them because it's even a scene in the book of Numbers where an Egyptian, a half-bred Egyptian son, came and spoke against the Most High's name and he was punished for it, but he was half Hebrew Israelite and half Egyptian. Mm, see, they had Egyptians and Cushites that was the mixed multitude that was with them. And guess what? The Most High didn't call them Gentiles. It was only the Romans, the Greeks, excuse me, the lineage of Japheth were the Gentiles. Those were the heathens. That there were some that were pagans because of their lack of knowledge in the same culture that the Hebrew Israelites had. But it was the job of the priesthood or the people to be a kingdom of priests and give this information to the indigenous people to help build them up. Not to conquer them, not to kick them when they down, when they housed you and clothed you and fed you. No. Those are our people in the struggle according to your own book, according to the Bible, according to the Tanakh. And, you're gonna and the second part, part I'm going to hammer it home, brothers and sisters. And you're going to see, again, even with the language and culture, that we're similar. Look at the Afro-Asiatic map that I put up there. We speak a similar dialect from a proto-Afro-Asiatic tongue. That's very important. We can't keep banging on each other. My, my Nile Valley African um, people and my Hebrew Israelites just come together, build and edify, and see that we're in a struggle together and all of our cultures were intermingled in our diaspora to display who we are as a people in America today, man. Beautiful. Anything else outside or the yeah. people? Y'all got a question? Yeah. What's up, That's man? That's beautiful, brother. Um, well, we got on time, too. Now, listen. You're going to be here for at least two weeks, you said. Yes, man. I'll be here. <laughs> okay. After we do part two, okay. when? When? Now, it sometime this week. next week? Oh, whenever. It's up to you, sir. Okay. We're going to do, do part two to this where you can really go in. But I would love, before you break out, 
I would love for you to come in here and do the alphabets, man. Oh, we got to get um, into that. The Hebrew, Hebrew alphabets. What about, what about Aramaic? You know anything about the Arabic alphabet? The Arabic? Yeah. Or Aramaic? Aramaic. Aramaic, yeah. Aramaic, I got that too. Okay, yeah. so this is what we're going to bring for y'all, family, because y'all can't look, look against look, the Hebrew. Look, too. That was something that was helped engineered by uh, Malachi Z. Rook, and he got that from the tonal languages. What we got to understand is that modern Hebrew now is no longer a tonal language. When you look at the classical Arabic, when they read from the Quran, it sounds like they're singing because those were the tones or the gutturals that they would use from the back of their throat in order to make their sentences and formulate their words. That's very important because we have a lack of that in our culture today speaking English because it was not designed for our culture, for our people, and even fit for our DNA. The brachia, lobe of your brain, deals with the motor skills necessary for speech and understanding for speech. That's very important. And in the African American in America, ours are shrunken and much smaller because the language we're speaking was not tuned to us as a people. The bridge of your, 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 um, your mouth. The, 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 um, the back of your throat, your tongue, all of this was responsible for us communicating and speaking tonal languages and we have to revert back to that. So that way when my movement comes forth, we're going to create a language which I'm in the process of forming right now that brings us back to the tonal languages that the Afro-Asiatic people spoke. And this is very, very important. But like my brother Sa says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do this language thing because nobody's really touching into this. I think what people are doing is keeping this language science to themselves so that way they can feel like they're better than everybody else. But you know what? I'm going to bring the knowledge to the masses and I'm going to break it down for you so easy and so plain. You can understand how we're so interrelated that we need to stop banging on each other and come together as a people.